Good evening. How are you tonight? Welcome to the show. Kind of um, somber. It's raining outside. We're in New York. It's raining outside. It's just a yucky, wet, rainy day. That sort of situation. And, um, you know, I wanted to do the show yesterday, <clears throat> but we had a, a pizza punk show schedule, which, by the way, you should listen to. Great episode. Yesterday's pizza punk episode. I had so much fun. And so we were committed to that. Otherwise, this show would have been done yesterday. And the purpose of tonight's show, I just want to put this out there before we begin. Um, I, you know, I met, I got, to, you know, I was fortunate enough to have met Howie several times and interviewed him uh, for a documentary project uh, that I have been working on for a very, very long time. And along with his, along with his bandmates, of course, too. Um, it's funny over the years, I interviewed Billy, uh, the lead singer, of the blessed Walter Luer of the, of the heartbreakers and also the blessed and Howie and all three of them are gone now. It's very, um, very sad, very, very sad. All three of them, wonderful people, all of them. Um, but I thought that, you know, cause we do, we've done this before on the show and Howie is an incredibly interesting character and. You know, he was on the mend. He had had a, a liver transplant. He was ailing, as as many people know. There were a lot of benefits and tributes. Sorry, benefits to fundraise for him for his bills, hospital bills, uh, care, and and whatnot. And um, I was just kind of waiting, waiting on the sidelines, um, because I really wanted to have him on Pizza Punk because the the Pizza Punk show. Because the thing about Howie Pyro is for those of for those who knew him. Uh, he he lived this incredible life. I mean, he he rubbed elbows and, you know, he was just around a lot of really, really interesting uh, moments in, in whatever this this punk rock culture scene thing, whatever you want to call it and uh, rock and roll. And um, it's, it's kind of almost like this punk rock force gump in the sense that, like, it's like he either knew like all these icons or he was like there for like, like for instance, the most famous one of all was that he was there the night that uh, Sid vicious uh, OD or the, the night, before, the, the night before he uh, died and whatnot. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I know he's written books. He, he is an, an author. He's many things. He's a run. This guy was a Renaissance man. He was a musician. He was an author. He was a DJ. He was a, a collector and curator of just kitsch and counterculture, like memorabilia, I guess is the best way to put it. And um, yeah, and he was just, he just seemed like such an awesome dude. My brief interactions with him were always super pleasant. He was super sweet and super um, generous with his time. You know, uh, and I'm really grateful for that, truly. And I saw someone else, this guy, Eric, the singer of the New Bomb Turks. He was talking about that the last time he saw Howie was at a King Kong and the Barbecue show. And I was also at that show and also saw Howie that night. That was the last time I saw him. Now, as I said, I don't want I do not know Howie. I'm not I was not like friends with that guy. Um, I just want to put that out there. I just, you know, I, I, and I'm an admirer of him and his work, and I just wanted to pay tribute to him on my channel. That's all. So that, that's all this is. And um, he just he's done a lot of really interesting, cool stuff. So let's begin. Let's just dive right into it. Uh, yes, David, I agree. Howie Pyro is a fantastic stage name. Originally uh, of Jewish descent. Um, he, uh, from from Queens, from Queens. Yes, he did play. He played in Danzig. He played on uh the seven 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 record. Um, and he's in the Kiss the Skull music video, which is great too. Uh, he, let's read this. Okay, so this is from the Brooklyn Vegan here. Hold on one moment. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. 
we'll just start at the top, the tippity top and go down, work our way down. I got a bunch of tabs opened up here. Here is an obituary. Uh, so I guess his epitaph is Degeneration, the band that he was probably most known for. Howie Pyro, bassist of Degeneration, uh, renowned DJ and co-founder of Coney Island High. Coney Island High, for those of you who don't know, I I'd never got to experience Coney Island High, but in the 90s, it was like the club. It was one of the clubs. It was the equivalent. It was like the punk rock rock and roll equivalent of of the limelight right everybody knows the limelight but that's for like you know like um club kids or whatever uh and coney island high was where like you know every punk band and rock and roll band i mean it was like uh it was on saint mark's place and it was um it was it was a happening place ramones played that i mean every band every band you could think of played there all these bands uh, when when the Misfits came back, they came back at Coney Island High. It was their first official show back, or I should say, Jerry and Doyle's Misfits. How here's the here's the statement. Here's the statement. He passed away at the age of sixty one. Um, too young, in my opinion. Howie Pyro died peacefully on May fourth, twenty twenty two, from complications due to COVID nineteen related pneumonia following a liver transplant and long battle with liver disease. The beloved and influential bassist, DJ Scene Maker. I think that's a great way to put it, right? A scene maker and troublemaker. And he did get into some trouble. I've heard stories, um, just hijinks, I should say. Uh, devoted his life to everything weird, wonderful, and wild in music. Uh, Pyro started out in the 1970s at Max's Kansas City and CBGB as a founder of the first underground punk band, The Blessed. And was a member of freaks that was a so he he took about 10 years off and then in the late 80s he formed this band freaks and uh with his wife with his wife and some other people and that you don't that you know they don't really hear people talk about freaks and their records are kind of hard to get a hold of and then yes the chelsea smiles degeneration and he was also a member of danzig and played on danzig 777 he co-founded the green door party in new york city the infamous club Coney Island High and was a member of the Black Lips Performance Cult. Now, the Green Door Party preceded Coney Island High, and that was like uh, I think that happened like once a month or something. And that was like um, that was like that was supposedly quite the soiree. And that kind of folded into Coney Island High, which he which he founded with Jesse Mallon from D Generation as well. And Jesse Mallon would go on. I mean, Jesse Mallon has the Bowerly Electric. I mean, there's a bunch of places that Jesse Mallon was involved in. Um, and I believe the Coney Island High closed in 1999. So it was around for about five, four to five years. How he collaborated with Johnny Thunders, Ronnie Spector, Rancid, right? He wrote the song. He wrote a song for, with Rancid. I'm trying to remember the name of it. You know, all the kids in the shooting gallery, Da, 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 da. It's on Punkorama 4. Uh, I forget the name of the song. I think it's called The Shooting Gallery, maybe. Uh, Joey Ramone, he he collaborated with Genesis P. Porridge. P. Orridge, sorry. I don't know how you pronounce that. The Misfits. Debbie, I don't know if he, he didn't collaborate with The Misfits. I think maybe they mean, mean to say Danzig again. I mean, he played shows with The Misfits. Uh, Debbie Harry, Kid Congo Powers, Ed Big Daddy Roth. Jane County and Alan Vega, a world renowned DJ Pyro hosted the groundbreaking show Intoxica radio, an infectious two hours of primitive, primitive 45 RPM records from the deep underbelly of the original rock and roll era. And that just so accurately says what I could not formulate with my own words, you know, um, and he had this thing with Intoxica. There was this little primitive caveman that people would get tattooed on them. And how he would like keep track of like who had the tattoo. You Google it. Google the primitive man. Um, and he was like an encyclopedic knowledge of 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 those rock and roll records of those of those seven inch rock and roll singles. You know, probably you knew as just you know the cramps. Lux Interior and Poison Ivy are always known as like the, the encyclopedic, you know, sort of that just that they knew a lot about that stuff. And I feel like Howie Pyro was 
right there next to him, right? He survived by his sister, Robin Hartman, Rory and Leah Hartman, former wife, Andrea Custon Matthews, and many cousins. In honor of Howie, please consider donating to the UCLA Division of Liver and Panc Pancreas Transplantation. So if you want to leave a contribution, that's where you go. Oh, man, he's going to be laid to rest at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. That's so apropos. That makes total sense. And they do lots of events there. I'm sure Howie attended many events there, you know, with his connection to the Ramones. In the, new, in the near future, there will be a big celebration of his life. I'm glad to hear that that they'll be doing something like that. Howie's degeneration bandmate, Jesse Mallon wrote, so this is from Jesse Mallon, his uh, frequent collaborator in, in several bands after degeneration broke up, they had another band and then Howie ended up in Danzig. And I'm trying to remember the name of that other band, uh, the acid dropouts or something. Um, Jesse writes, this is the hardest post I've ever had to write. Howie Pyro was my best friend and brother. Howie Pyro, my best friend and brother, has passed away. He fought real hard until the end. Um, he changed my life and so many others. Ugh, he changed my life and so many others in ways I can't even begin to say. We made our world together from Whitestone, Queens to Madison Square Garden and even and every crazy, dirty little place in between. I learned so much from him. He made this planet a much better, cooler, weirder, and more beautiful place for decades. For decades, he impacted so many different kinds of people and so many different scenes all over with his style, his taste, his music, his knowledge, his art, his fashion, his attitude, his humor, his records, his movies, his bravery, his swagger, his smile his heart, and his compassion. Thank you to everyone who bought a ticket, a shirt, donated, said a prayer, or sent a message to help him out. He really got to see the love in a huge way from all of you, and it meant so much to him. His importance and impact will never, ever be forgotten. I will love you forever, my dear Dr. Howard. Um, I mean, I think that is really nice that when they were doing all these events for him that he got to see, yeah, he got to see all of that love. And you know what, man, all the tributes are pouring in on Facebook and whatnot. I've been reading through them and we're going to read two of them. I picked out two to read. Um, and I, I, I said this and I think it's so true. I feel like anybody who friggin' knew him, loved him, like really loved him. He just seemed like such a lovable guy, you know, and just into really, really cool stuff. And his life was so interesting. As I said, um, or as it said here, you know, he crossed paths with everybody and was just, you know, probably had a thousand, had a thousand stories. There's pictures of him with Hazel Atkins and Screaming Jay Hawkins and just, you know, Joey Ramone and, and Joe Strummer and hanging out with Johnny Thunders, being in a band with Walter Lure, being in a band with Danzig. You know, I mean, just just so much stuff. He one of the first guys to work at Manic Panic on uh, St. Mark's, you know, Tish and Snooky store. When Howie was fighting for his life, several musicians and other public figures paid tribute to him, including Debbie Harry, Lenny K. They all knew him, Lenny K. and and known and Noni, John Travolta. What? I didn't know he knew John Travolta, Jimmy G of Murphy's Law, uh, Theo. Kogan of Lunachicks, Donita Sparks of L7, Matt Sorm of Guns N' Roses, and more. Read those tributes here so you can actually read some of those tributes for, for the sake of, I really want to just try and get a, a cross section of, of, of Mr. Pyro. So I'm, I'm going to just put the, I'm going to put those, those tributes in the comments if anybody wants to read them, but I'm not going to read them because we'll just, we'll be here for a very long time. We're probably we're going to be here too long as it is. There we go. I just put it in the comments for anybody who wants to um, check that out. Um, man. Hmm. I'm really glad that he got to re and he reunited with, with D generation. They reunited. They put out a record in 2016, played, a, played a bunch of shows. Hmm. Hmm. Really, really a bummer that he just never got to write a book, man, or that he never wrote a book about his life. That's that's what it is. That's kind of why I wanted to do this. Not not that it's going to be just just to you know, 
pay tribute to a really cool life of a very, very interesting dude. Okay, so now here's a tribute from, I, I, I've never said this dude's name out loud. He's frequently in this book, one of my favorite books about punk rock. He's in this book. He knew how he, he was, he was the lead singer of a band called the Senders that played at like Max all over the place in New York, especially Max's Kansas city. His name's, uh, he was also sort of, um, um, an associate of Johnny thunders on some level. His name is, uh, Felipe Marcade. And I hope that's how you pronounce it. And I apologize if it's not. And, um, he, uh, we had once read one of his um, one of his stories about Screaming Jay Hawkins, actually, that's on this channel. Great storyteller. Let's see what he says about Howie Pyro. He says, Howie Pyro was a very important member of our little Max's Kansas City family. He definitely was a VIP, very important Pyro. I knew him since 78, and we remained good friends until his passing a few days ago. Back in 78, Howie and his band, The Blessed, beat everyone at being young. That's right. So they were like the hot young band, the blessed. And um, everybody loved these guys. And uh, they were just kids compared to everybody else. The only person who was younger was Harley Flanagan, who came. He, Harley Flanagan had a band called Little Drummer Boy or something. Little Little Big Boss. And then he had the, the stimulators. And he was, I mean, he was really young. He was born in 67. Um, but these kid, these guys were, especially Billy Stone was very young. Billy Stone, the singer of the blessed. And eventually Walter Lure joined the band and Walter Lure was in the heartbreakers, which was kind of like the heartbeat center of, of all that stuff. Right. Um, so having Walter in the band made them even more legitimate. They never put out an album. They did record a seven inch. So back in 78, Howie and his band, The Blessed, beat everyone out at being young. They were the youngest, yet one of the best and craziest bands at Max's. His sense of style was unbeatable, too. He always dressed great and had a great haircut. And there's plenty of pictures to prove that, to back that up. If you go search for pictures of Howie, he really did look really cool. Uh, most of all, he was one of the coolest, hippest, funniest, and sweetest person on the scene, persons on the people on the scenes. Um, as the years passed, Howie became an avid collector. He collected anything rock and roll, old, weird, and fabulous, weird old movies, weird old records, weird old posters, weird old magazines, weird old anything from weird shower curtains to weird action figures. Howie's weird record collection became huge and he started playing the best of them in his legendary weekly radio show in Toxica, along with the hound Miriam Lina and the great late Billy Miller. Howie was one of the great rare rock and roll collectors in New York. Meanwhile, he went on to play bass in some amazing bands, Degeneration, Danzig, the freaks and the action swingers. I believe the action swingers predated Degeneration right before they formed that. Not to mention recording with Joey Ramone and Genesis P. Orridge. That's an impressive resume. Above all, what I will always remember, what I will always remember how, what I will always, this is not, sorry, the punctuation here. Above all, what I will always remember Howie for is his genuine lust for life, his contagious excitement for all things rock and roll. I especially remember one night in 1989 at the Continental Divide, when Wild Bill Thompson, I believe Wild Bill Thompson was in the senders, maybe got on stage with Sea Monster uh, sans guitar to sing The Crusher by the Novas. Uh, Do the hammerlock, which the, the Cramps famously covered a lot. Sea Monster is another sort of great unknown band uh, sex God chant for anybody. Go search the Sea Monster on my channel. I used to shoot their shows. Um, at those Max's Kansas City reunions. Very interesting band. They're still around. They play all the time. Um, I was standing next to Howie and he was going nuts. He looked at me with a big smile and said, this is so great. Oh my God, I wish I had a camera and film that. It was even more thrilling to see Howie's excitement that uh, than to see Wild Bill singing The Crusher. I don't know who, uh, maybe I'm, I'm trying to remember who Wild Bill Thompson was. I thought he was maybe in the senders with, with Felipe. Maybe not. Yesterday, I found out that Howie had left this planet. 
There's an initial shock which numbed me and all the photos and tributes here on Facebook that warmed my heart. But today, as I woke up, I felt nothing but sadness, the sad realization that, indeed, he's gone for real and that he will not be here anymore to make us laugh or to make us admire the latest weird addition to his collection. I will miss you, Howie. Here's a pic of me between two of the greatest punk, punk rockers New York ever had, Dee Dee and Howie, at CBGB's in the early 90s. That looks like it's right by the bar. Yeah. Or is that a coat rack? Huh. Um, R.I.P. Gabba Gabba Hey. That's a great, what a great tribute. Thank you, Felipe, for posting that. For us, for those of us like myself who did not know Howie so intimately, it's like, I like reading this stuff. It's interesting to, to learn more about him. Um, such a interesting guy. This is a tribute from Jonathan Tobin. Uh, he does, uh, he's also a DJ and he does this thing called New York night train. And he wrote this post about Howie. they had done. Matter of fact, the last time that I saw Howie was at Jonathan Tobin's night train show when King Kong and the barbecue show played. That was that night. Um, and as, as, uh, what's his face said, he was indeed holding court at the back table. Just a just a boss, man. He really was. Um, Jonathan says, I've been absolutely shattered by the passing of one of my favorite people to grace this earth. Biggest inspirations and best pals. Howie Pyro. I have way too many things to say and way too many pictures to properly memorialize this towering figure in both my life and work to sufficiently express what he meant to me on social media. While Howard Custon will deservedly be primarily remembered for his role as a musician and OG 77 CBGB punk rocker. I don't think a lot of people understand how unique, important, and influential he was as a DJ. He was one of the first to understand what I was trying to do and helped me become who I am with his generous opinions, advice, and vast musical knowledge when I got my start. I'm sure there are multitudes with a similar story. Howie quickly went from friend and hero to regular DJ partner, and we had a blast spinning dozens of nights together and so uh, at so many places over the years. Um, like his flair, exuberance, taste, and they broke the mold when they made him uniqueness. What made Howie such an interesting person in life made him an amazing DJ. And perhaps his greatest strength of all was his ability to understand, respect, and mix with different subcultures and generations. Howie was a member of so many deep corners of punk, goth, metal, rockabilly, and garage cultures, and used this insider knowledge to bring these groups together into a single entity, both in life and on the dance floor. Wow, what a beautiful uh, sentiment that is. Um, Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I once wound up at an East L.A. death metal show in a concrete room full of sweaty young moshers and ran into Howie, who knew everybody there. He was also the first to introduce me to the Midnighters, who were in their 70s. Sometimes we would be working and Debbie Harry or Vincent Gallo or some 21-year-old punk kid would pop in to say hi. He was the secret glue holding the universe together. I'm so blessed to have gotten to spend so much time hanging out, uh, talking on the phone, and in general, having this smart, witty, and unique individual in my life for so many years. It's going to be hard living in a world without Howie, but I know all of us will continue to carry his many gifts with us. Beautiful, man. Beautiful tribute to Mr. Pyro. Let's see if we can pull. Do you see these pictures? That I just, yeah, there we go. There they are looking at records. That's Jonathan on the right. Another picture of sorts. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, another uh, another picture. There there you have it, folks. I mean, how he, how he knew everybody, man. He just knew he knew so many people. He knew so many. Oh, there's, that's uh, Shannon from Shannon and the Clams. How about that? <laughs> So cool, man. Oh, there's, oh, this was the night. Uh, no, that's not, but there's, that's, uh, 
That's King Kong from King Kong and the Barbecue Show. Oh, was this the night? Was this the night of that show? Maybe. Um, because that looks like what King Kong was wearing. I took a picture with him, and he was, I'm pretty sure he was wearing gold sequinted like hot shorts. Um, what a dude, huh? Okay, let's move on now. Now, let's go back a little ways to when Howie first started out. Well, hold on, I see some comments here. RIP. Josh says that D Gen is one of my favorite bands. And when I went to see Danzig, I was hanging around near the bus waiting for Glenn to sign some stuff. Howie randomly came up to me and said, What's up, dude? That's really sweet. Um, like we were long lost pals. Nice dude. Nicest dude. And I always tried to emulate his cool hair. Hey, what's up, Ron? How are you, man? Ron's in the chat. Ron P. Great guy. Phenomenal mustache. If you know Ron, you see his mustache. It's a strong mustache. I aspire to his mustache game someday in some way. All right. So let's go back a ways. Let's go back to Howie's uh, childhood a little bit. This is an interview he did with Gray <laughs> with Gravy with uh, Gravy Zine. We're going to take a look at it real quick right here. Hold the phone. Hold the phone. Here we go. I got it. This is an interview that talks a little bit about Howie's childhood, I think, and then it it goes into other other stuff. And we just got we got a couple more things, a couple more pieces, kind of like like that. Let's see if I can just get this popped open. All right. Growing up, monster interview with Howie Pyro. Uh, this is by this was posted by Samia and it's for gravy zine. Uh, being obsessed with something can be a great thing. It's a compulsive need to do something, uh, uh, to do something feeling that what, what is that? What positive? Po it's that compulsive need to do something that drives you, makes you makes inspiring stuff happen that that's not a sentence i don't know what sense howie pyro is a person compelled obsessed and maybe a little possessed with the same monstery feeling and look of things music people and attitude as he was in his affected youth this is not written very well in this emailed interview howie indulges and immerses us in a vivid rendering of what once was the wild era of the 70s through 90s New York City punk music scene, the start of degeneration and the thrilling times during the Green Door NYC D DJing days, and his love of spinning his awesome collection of 45s uh, now in California on his Intoxica radio show. Um, hold on, we're going to take a comment before we read that. This is from Mushroom Leg. Hey, Jeff, bro, working on inventory at the restaurant, but just wanted to take a moment to say hello, sir. Thank you for all the amazing content. I will not sleep tonight because of work. Ah, well, you can sit and listen to me jabber until I'm not jabbering anymore. Uh, if it'll help you pass the time while you're doing your inventory, but thanks for dropping in mushroom. I appreciate it. Uh, and, and I hope your I hope your shift. Um, I may your shift pass smoothly and quickly. Um, the interviewer asks, where were you born and raised? And Howie uh, talks in capitals. I was born and raised in Whitestone, Queens, like Johnny Thunders, members of Kiss, the Dictators, and others. Uh, interviewer asks, when did you buy your first record? When did you start collecting stuff? Books, records, monsters, toys. Uh, Howie says, I was first in, I, when people type in, I mean, I, listen, I, uh, uh, no disrespect to Howie who has just left us, but I, <laughs> maybe it's not his fault. Maybe, maybe the, uh, may, maybe the person did this interview, put it in caps, but the, whenever I read caps, I just want to scream. I was first into monsters. <laughs> I was first into monsters, movies, and TV shows on TV. Then I go with my parents to garage sales and, and memorabilia shops as my parents were into old movies, music, books, etc. I started buying records around them 
when I was six or seven. And since I was into monsters, I would buy any record that was monstery. Ha ha. So I wound up with some interesting 45s that put me before my time, like psycho by the Sonics, uh, psychotic reaction, the spider and the fly, etc. Psycho by the Sonics is a great, great record. If you've not heard it. Um, and here's a picture of a young Howie with some magazines. You know, Howie was on an episode of Hoarders for his collection, for his collecting prowess. I kind of want to watch it now. I've never seen it, but he was he was filmed. He was filmed for that. The interviewer asked, can you paint a picture of your early years? What was your earliest memory of being deeply affected by music, uh, punk, subculture, monsters? How do you can how did it, how does it all connect for you? He goes, well. I was born in 1960, so my early years were long before any punk subculture existed. I was from about age 11 on a very, very deeply affected by me. I was, he was from the age of 11. He was very, very deeply affected by music. First of all, it was the weird records I was buying at garage sales. Then a serious oldies fixation during the big oldies boom in the early 70s. Then Alice Cooper, Stooges, T Rex, Bowie, Mott the Hook. Hoople, uh, Roxy Music, The Sweet, Slade, etc. The first LP I bought was Mother Mania by the Mothers of Invention, which created a lifelong Frank Zappa obsession. I was that guy in school that everyone came to to find out about new music. When punk happened, I was right in the middle of it and so deeply affected that I ran away from home. That's the story. That's the famous story about his youth, that he ran away from home at that at the time when i was around 16 and never went back and i'm still there he says in quotations 40 years later it all tied together for me very early on and as i went through life i kept meeting one person after another that felt the same way there was the monster movie club at club at, at club 57 and that's and then he says then i met glenn danzig and brought those guys there so Glenn Danzig actually came to the Monster Movie Club because of Howie Pyro and, and of course, brought Jerry. And what they would do is, and then that's eventually, that led to the Irving Plaza, that very famous, infamous Irving Plaza show in 1979 that we talked about. You know, that, in my opinion, when you look back historically, that put the misfits, that kind of puts the misfits on the map after opening for the Dand, which also... Howie is kind of involved with in the sense that the blessed were supposed to open for the dam, but they could not. And that left a space open for the misfits to kind of step in and do those shows. Um, and what's interesting is the, the misfits had been gigging around for almost two years before that they are a part, they are contemporaries of all those New York punk bands. They're playing Max against Indian stuff, but, I, I don't I don't think it's until 79 that they're really starting to make a splash in that kind of way. And that's when it seems to me, from what I've seen and read and spoken to with Howie, because I interviewed Howie, that that he was closest to the misfits in 1979. There's that footage of them. Uh there's that footage of them at Studio Zero where Howie's singing the Peppermint Twist. They're just jamming in a in a studio rehearsal space. It's very, very loose and um informal in in what they're doing uh but the monster movie club was run by uh susan hannaford and ann magnuson the actress and two other people who i am not remembering and natasha dunzio used to go there george harrington uh dave street and uh my friend tony matura uh who's been on the channel he used to go to the monster movie club and of course the misfits would and um, perhaps it's even where they got the uh, the inspiration to play movies and movie trailers and then jump out from behind the screen to play. They'd set up white seamless paper and, and burst out of it uh, to begin um, uh, and, and begin their set. Um, so he brought those guys and they were getting into all sorts of hijinks, the misfits with with Howie. Uh, they definitely got arrested. They uh, they uh, they trashed some hotel rooms, from my understanding. Um, I, I don't uh, allegedly allegedly trashed some hotel rooms, throwing TVs out a window. Um, end up in like I don't know the drunk tank or something of something similar of the ilk. Uh, just wild and crazy stuff that they used to do in New York City at that time. 
Um, he says, uh, everywhere I went, I met monster freaks that were in bands. May I also add that I pretty much am exactly the same now as I was when I was 12 years old, living out these same few early obsessions, fantasies. There's another picture of Howie. This is the Rocky Horror Picture Show soundtrack behind him. Can you talk about your early New York City punk years? How did you get to meet all these legendary New York City punk characters, people, Sid Vicious, Billy Idol, Deborah Harry? He says, that's kind of a weird question. I was young, understood what it was, what it meant, was am funny, knew my rock and roll history. I get along with people easy, easily. What am I supposed to say to that that isn't self-flattery, that isn't a self-flattering sounding thing? So how he doesn't feel good about this question. Uh, I was way younger than all those other people on the scene. My band, The Blessed, was a favorite of all the seasoned bands. So that's the thing. You have some bands that are like a band's band. And what does that mean? It means like, like it means that like, yes, maybe they're like, um, they, they have a following on some level, but what makes them, what elevates them is almost the fact that that other bands worship them. You know who, you know who I think really is like that? Uh, the band Fishbone is like that you know the band fishbone is a band and frankly the stooges were kind of that too right like the stooges were kind of like that um as a matter of fact in 1983 the beastie boys and reagan youth asked the blessed to they wanted the blessed to open for them and um they reunited uh they reunited several times over the years the last one was in the all the 2010s was the last time they reunited um with walter lure i believe it was before walter lure passed away um oh uh, yeah michelle knows what's up yeah fishbone is like one of those bands like you know you look at the red hot chili peppers sublime like all these bands that are just you know like larger than life or bigger than life they all love fishbone but fish and fishbone has a very very dedicated fan base i don't want to take away from that at all and they they do very well for themselves but like they're not they're they're not like they're not a household name, you know. But you ask any band, yo, are you like into are you down with Fishbone or like you know certain bands, especially in L.A. Fishbone, Fishbone, everybody knows Fishbone. Fishbone's great, phenomenal. And I feel like that's the same thing with the Blessed too. So that's why he's saying the Blessed was a favorite of all these seasoned bands. When we played, no one our age that were starting to meet could go in to see us. So nobody could get in there. Our whole audience early on was the Ramones, the Dead Boys, Heartbreakers, Blondie, Cramps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're literally playing for other bands. And each one of these bands is super, super duper iconic. Then people were drawn to uh, drawn to see us because of our audience who were by this time our friends. These people were in these people were famous to me, but to no one but no one was famous really at all in the world. It was a small scene and everyone knew everyone. This is like, I, I guess this is, this must be around 77, 78. Uh, I don't know, 76, maybe, maybe as early as 76. You know, the original punk New York punk scene really kind of like starts in 73 ish and goes till about 77, 78. Right. And then things kind of shift. Younger kids come in. Uh, new wave sort of branches off. The record labels want to call it new wave. And you have like the first heart, what would be known as the hardcore bands. And then eventually that would turn into like a derivative cookie cutter sort of thing. And by 84, it's kind of like tapped out, you know? Um, it was a small scene and everyone knew everyone. So what may look like legendary to you now was really just a small bunch of outcasts who had no one else to really be friends with except other bands on the Lower East Side, which, of course, changed quickly after this. I think that's a great breakdown of that's a great breakdown. He says, what was N New York City like back in those days? What about compared to now? He says, well, then it was a destroyed, abandoned city of burned out buildings, crazy people, junkies, criminals, where anyone could afford to live for close to nothing, not really having not really even having to work a place with incredible. So it's like you could be in a band and play a couple of gigs and make enough money to pay your rent. The heartbreakers used to do something called, and they mainly did this. They did this more after the, 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 the official heartbreakers broke up. 
I think the Heartbreakers like officially kind of broke up in 79. Don't quote me on that. And then occasionally they would get together in some iteration and they would do something called a rent party. And the first Waldo's album, Walter Lewis band, um, the Waldo's the, the album is called rent party and a rent party was kind of like, you know, you, you play a couple of shows, you do a weekend of, of gigs at, at Max's Kansas city to get enough money. And that was enough money to pay your rent, especially if you're living, you know, in, in that kind of area. I mean, this, you, you can't have, I mean, yes, scenes form all the time. And yes, punk scenes still kind of like happen or like counterculture scenes still happen, but there was nothing like that, that late seventies. You had all the perfect factors that lined up. Everybody's in a band, super small community, downtrodden sort of place where nobody really wants to go. It just all lines up in that kind of way. Um, <laughs> Where did I lose? He goes, he says, uh, a place with incredible history that people like me obsessed on. Beat Generation, Warhol, Velvets, New York Dolls, the entire insane 60s movement, the good and the bad side, and all the art and culture that springs out of poverty. Here, He says it way better than me. Thank you, Howie. All the art and culture that springs out of poverty, low rent, and enough free time to create the above. What an insightful sentence that basically sums up everything it's really that was that's good he says uh now my big one he they used to pay 150 dollars a month apartment that three people lived in um so now currently that 150 dollars a month apartment would be 2500 uh and i would say probably maybe even more than that do I have any mods in the chat that can get rid of this bot, please? If there's anybody here who is uh, here, Runner is now officially a mod. Hold on. Is he? Is he a mod? Yep. Okay. Runner, Runner, you have been made a mod and you can, you can uh, boot that, boot that person right now. Thank you. Oh, Rue is here. Okay, well, I've deputized Runner as well. So we have Runner and Rue. Thank you, Rue, for doing that. Rue Morg to the rescue, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, and people of all, all, all shapes and sizes. So a $2,500 a month apartment was about $150. Um, he says, probably lived by an NYU student and paid for by daddy. Uh, where art and creativity are not welcome. Does that answer your question? Ha, ha, ha. Look at him with his Alice Cooper um, shirt. It's great. How did G Generation form? He says, I was friends with Jesse for many years. Jesse was in a band called Heart Attack when he was 14, hardcore band that played with the Misfits and the Undead. And I believe uh, Danny Sage was also in Heart Attack. And I also interviewed Danny. Really, really nice dude. Both those guys in D Gen. He says, I was friends with Jesse for many years and wound up in his circle of friends when my band Freaks broke up. I wound up moving in with Jesse and John Carco and was asked to try and start a band with their friends, Danny and Michael, Sage and Wildwood, who are brothers, the brothers that wound up in G generation later. We all tried to play together and it was a bit ah stressful and I quit and asked Jesse to start a new band, which we did. I was very close with uh, Rick, who's uh, Richard, Richard Bacchus. Bacchus, is that how you pronounce it? And wanted him to be in it. Jesse and I were backing up Rick's solo project at the time. Then we got uh, Georgie Seville on second guitar and a million drummers, starting with the with Bell VK, none of who worked out. I went to the UK to do a tour with the Action Swingers, and somehow, har har, in my absence, Jesse asked Michael and Danny to play in Degeneration, and that became the classic lineup. And there they are. Um, can you talk about the Coney Island Green Door days? What do you consider the height of these times or these good times? He says, we started Green Door. We started Green Door as our hatred of the 80s and the fact that there was nowhere to go on New Year's Eve in 8990. So they started, you know, they created the fellowship that they craved and started started a thing. Um, oh my God, Rude, do not apologize at all. Thank you for, for doing that. And I'm glad to have Runner Dial Zero, who's here often as well, um, uh, deputize as well. It's just the, the the you know if you guys are regulars here, you might as well just be be mods and deputies on the channel and just make sure that we don't get any bots. 
in in the comments. So thank you, thank you for being here. I DJed with Rick, uh, Rick Bacchus, and Holly Ramos. It was a major success, so we started doing it regularly. That lasted for fourteen years. Wow, Degeneration grew out of that party and played our first gig there. It was originally at the building home of Giorgio uh, Gam Gamelski, who had the Crawdaddy Club in the early 60s, where he discovered the Rolling Stones. Let them fly the coop as he discovered the Yardbirds and was producing their records and many others. I mean, he's just a walking history encyclopedia of rock and roll. He was a wild Russian man with a major attitude and a major accent. The only person that turned beet red and called me a nincompoop and was serious. He went on to do tons of major wild stuff, uh, Soft Machine, Gong, Magma, Julie Driscoll, etc. He moved to New York City in 76 and bought that building for pennies and made it a workspace for bands and artists and anyone that needed it. Uh, we were his pet band and we were, and he was a major influence. It was a punk hardcore club when he was first there and also an SM club called Paddles. <laughs> We all played there, blessed, heart attack, et cetera. Sometimes we'd have to move our equipment back in late at night when it was the SM club. Ha <laughs> ha. After a few years, Green Door NYC, the official name, got too big. Up till then, it stayed open till everyone decided to leave around 8 a.m. usually. My God, there'd be people fucking on the floor. Here's look at it. Look at this picture. Great picture of Howie right here says there'd be people banging on the floor in the DJ booth, enough drugs to kill a small country and almost never any problems. It started to be infiltrated by rock stars and celebs. And we started to move the club around. We did it at the limelight. Oh, so they actually did it at the limelight and other places till we went to this great club in the middle of St. Mark's place. It was owned by hairdresser, Paul McGregor, who had been in that building since 1965. He created the shag haircut for Jane Fonda for the movie Clute. So he just knows all this random stuff. It's so cool, man. Uh, he would drive his psychedelic Rolls Royce out of the, the ground floor onto St. Mark's Place. The movie Shampoo was partially based on him. How about that? After he closed his hair shop, it was a roller rink. In the 70s, I saw the Misfits and other bands there then. Wow. Uh, then in the 80s, 90s, it was only open once a week for a very popular club called Boy Bar, where all the now famous and infamous drag queens, RuPaul, RuPaul Lady Bunny, Miss Guy, etc., did their early shows. We had many friends there, even an almost early member of the Blessed. Arthur, a.k.a. Darvon Staggered, was a bartender there. We asked if we could have a party there on Saturday night since they were never open, and then Paul said yes, and the place was huge. Three floors. The main floor had a large stage and a full PA DJ booth, and we started doing it regularly there. And then Paul McGregor wanted out, so Jesse Mallon and a couple of his friends invested, and we all opened Coney Island High. The club was a huge success, and the main place, even more than CBGB's at the time. The Ramones, there's Joey and, and Howie right there, uh, played their last New York show there. The Beastie Boys played there and endless incredible things went on there. It was the last real rock and roll club in New York City. Uh, we we brought the feeling of the 60s Warhol scene, Max's Kansas City, et cetera, to the 90s. I'm so bummed. I was just too young to experience it, man. I was like right there. Man, five, if I was just five years older, I probably, may, maybe a little bit older, maybe if I was about eight years older, I probably would have been hanging out there, I would imagine. Uh, I got to see CBGBs in the last three years of its existence, right? That's when I started going to CBGBs. And um, I just was too too late, man. Sucks. It sounds amazing. Just hearing him talk about it and whatnot. Um, that's the way the cookie crumbles. He says, it was one of the most incredible times of my life. And fuck Rudy Hitler, Giuliani for closing Coney Island High. So Giuliani is the reason why it closed. And all the other clubs in New York City downtown. Uh, the entire time it was open, it was the height of the of the entire '90s in New York City, in many people's opinion. Man, he's and then the guy at the the interviewer asked, "What do you miss about New York New York City?" Uh, how he says, "People mainly. There's not much left to miss, sadly, because Ray's Egg Creams on Avenue A, the only thing left from my youth. Although that's now closed down." 
Now, Ray Ray's Egg Creams. Wait, is that Avenue A? Well, what's the place? No, no, no. I'm thinking of the place on, on St. Mark's, on the corner of St. Mark's, where the New York Dolls uh, took that infamous um, picture. Um, Wayne says that was a great place. I saw a few bands there. That's awesome. Wayne, who did you see there out of curiosity, uh, if you remember? Okay, here we go. Um, Howie Pyro talks about touring with Danzig. He says, "How wa- uh, the interviewer asked, how was it touring with Danzig? Are you and he friends? Uh, Howie says, I love this picture of them. Look at Howie with his hair in the front of his face. I love this picture. Um, this is the 777 lineup. He says, touring with Danzig was amazing. He was always extremely generous and a good guy. Yes, we have been friends for 40 years. Um, And what's interesting is, so they toured the world, how he toured the world with Danzig. And at one point in time, he was living in the back of Glenn's house. Uh, How he's also featured in the Kiss the Skull video, which we mentioned earlier. And it's really great. He's doing this really sort of weird sort of like head banging thing his bass has like 666 print on it there's a couple of live shows uh of this this version of danzig when i look at this version this version this lineup was around from 2000 to 2002 and howie i guess you know how he remained tight with glenn even after that um what happened was he and todd left because they had another band i'm it's either the Chelsea smiles or Chrome locust. One of the two, I don't remember. They had a record deal and uh, they bounced because they, they were, they were getting signed and what ended up happening was the record never came out. Um, so yeah, Rue Morg says Rue Morg went to Coney Island high and he says, I've seen the Ramones degeneration, social distortion, guar, et cetera. The early nineties was lit. That's awesome, Rue. I'm glad you got to experience all of that at Coney Island High. So Rue was there. Rue can attest to all that stuff, as Wayne can. Uh, Wayne says, I think more. Oh, oh, here. We missed it. Wayne says, the damned uh, Nashville P-U-S-S-Y, uh, the first reunited misfits. So, oh, Wayne, were you at, Wayne, you were at the first uh, misfit show with Greg, uh, with uh, not Greg, with Graves and Chud. Um, what do you remember about that Misfits show, that Misfits 95 show, if you don't mind me asking? Rue says, yeah, we called Giuliani uh, Mussolini. He killed St. Mark's. Well, it's only gotten worse since the 90s, Rue, because now it's like atrocious. At least, you know, it's funny. In the early 2000s, you still had like Trash and Vaudeville. St. Mark's Comics was still there. Sounds was still there. Um there were a couple of places that were still there. St. Mark's Hotel, Kim's music video was still there. Um, and it, and now all of that is gone too. And it really is just nothing. There's just nothing there. Like truly, truly nothing there. Uh, such a bummer, man. Such a bummer. Um, what's his face? Uh, interviewer says, if you could play a show with anyone, what would the lineup be? Uh, where would you play? How he says, I suppose the only band... I'd have any want to have, blah, blah, blah. I suppose any, the only band I'd want to play with would be the, the cramps with Lux, Ivy and Nick Knox. We could play at any mental institution. Uh, the interviewer asked any favorite places to play and how he says Madison square garden was very thrilling being a New York boy, but Irving Plaza will always be my favorite. Irving Plaza is a great venue still around. One of the few venues left that's still around. Um, anything exciting happened to you on your recent tour? He says, I met a lot of really cool people and opened many ears to music. They didn't know. I feel like that's, that was how he's mission, right? A little bit like being the DJ like that, um, playing all these interesting, weird records, turning people onto music that they didn't know. Uh, one guy from a classic 60s surf garage band started talking to me and sent me one of his very, very rare 45s. His band was the sand trippers. Here's, here's how he now, or or then um, that's what, how he looked like when I, he did this interview right around the time I interviewed him. And that's what he looked like at the end. Uh, why did you move to California? Was that an easy decision? Um, how he says, I moved here because Danzig is based here 
And when I was in Danzig, I tried to live in New York, but it just didn't work. It was a very difficult decision, but one I'm very thankful for now. I couldn't possibly afford to live in New York now. Um, can you talk about your Intoxica radio show? He says, I, t I started my radio show almost 12 years ago. It was a long time dream of mine and one that legitimizes spending all of my money on records. Cause he literally, he took what he loved and he turned it into a living. Isn't that cool, man? I mean, that's the beauty. Like, like that's like, that's like the beauty. That's the beautiful reward of doing what you love in life. If you don't have obligations, you know, there's some people that have families and like have very particular obligations need to make a certain amount of money. And it's like, you can't, you can't just go and do anything you have to, if you have people to take care of, but like, you know, if you're not tied down by any of that and you want, like, if you have a passion, pursue it, man, do what you love. And then maybe one day you might start getting paid for it. You know, um, it's beautiful. Here's something that's very interesting. So apparently, uh, Graves started to get winded at the very first uh, resurrected Misfits show at Coney Island High. And Jimmy Gestapo from Murphy's Law, who I guess was in attendance, started to sing when Graves had gotten winded. How about that? That's very, very interesting. So I guess, you know, it's funny too, because there's video. There's video of that. Uh, show, but I don't, I'm trying to remember if I, if, if I saw Jimmy Gestapo there, maybe it was, I don't know. Maybe it was, uh, I don't know. I don't know, but that's interesting. What an interesting, uh, little antidote there. Antidote, antidote, antidote. Uh, Ace Von Johnson says I'm about two minutes behind, but Chelsea smiles was originally called the disciples. Thank you. Ace, uh, Ace knows all these guys. Ace knew, knew uh, Todd youth. Uh, um, uh, Todd youth was Ace's mentor. He knew how he, he knew, he knew all the, all these guys in all these circles, dude, Hawaiian barbecue. Ah, so Jimmy Gestapo sang horror business. According to Wayne. Thank you for that. Wayne. Appreciate it. Archduke Ramon says when I was in college in Vermont in the mid eighties, I would occasionally spend a few days on the Lower East side. Was that CBGB's The Ritz, Mud Club, The Bar, Downtown, Beirut? That's cool, man. That's really cool. Um, point being, just do what you love. He says, I play rare and weird 45s from the 50s and 60s. Some records that I've, been, that I've been looking for for 30 years. Some I just uncovered for the first time last week. There's literally hundreds of thousands of insane rock and roll records made in the 15 years I'm most interested in. After a few years, when I got more savvy with the internet, and at the same time, a fan started recording my show and sending me the MP3 so that I could post it online and so people could hear it at their leisure. The show got very popular. It's been on joyous. It's been a joyous experience for me and has brought me all over the world. It's just as satisfying to me as playing music. I've been DJing for 39 years. My first DJ gig was at the first was at the first DJ at the legendary mud club. He was the, so he was the first DJ at, at the mud club. That's awesome. Do you DJ at other places? Uh, Howie, I do know that Howie used to, um, Howie used to DJ at, uh, the, uh, the ACE hotel, the ACE hotel. He used to always post about that. Dagger love said, Howie is my favorite misfit. Um, Ace Von Johnson says, when I was in Murphy's Law, we used to do a ton of random cover jams on stage, including Misfits tunes. Um, as Ace puts it, I was Todd's protege. Um, they were good. Ace says they were good people and will be missed. Most certainly, most certainly missed and most certainly remembered. Crazy white boys in the house. How you doing? He says, Coney Island High was such a cool venue. Great episode. Nice to see you, uh, CWB. Hope you're well. Um, this is interesting. Uh, the interviewer asked, asks Howie. Okay, this is really interesting. The interviewer asks Howie, how did you DJ for Christina Aguilera? 
Howie Pyro responds, she wanted a rock and roll party for her 21st birthday. And I'm one of those DJs that gets those sort of gigs. So they hired me and Twiggy from Marilyn Manson. That's crazy. Um, other DJs you love and admire out there. He writes The Hound, Jim Marshall, Jonathan Tobin, uh, Rex on WFMU, Roger Mars, and of course the old originators, Wolfman Jack, Alan Fre Alan Freed, the father of rock and roll, that, for who there would be no screaming Jay Hawkins, Mad Mike Murray, the K, uh, Porky Chedwick, the Mad Daddy, George Hound. Da, 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 da. Um, can you talk about some of the writing you've done? What have you written and what publications books? He says, I'm a staff writer for my favorite blog, Dangerous Minds. I, I work on books with Brian Ray uh, Tor Tor Torcott, I don't know, uh, which is Punk is Dead, Punk is Everything. I wrote uh, Egg Ed Big Daddy Roth's autobiography with him. I'm in a lot of music history books like PKM, which we just let's let's take a, a quick minute. He's in PKM. Let's read the. I, I I put a bookmark in here so we could read this very small excerpt from this book. If you've never read PKM, you must. This is how Howie Pyro Harry Pyro's footnote after Sid Vicious died. Okay, that's where we're picking this up. Um, Eileen Polk. So Eileen Polk was the manager for a band called The Blessed. She used to take pictures of the Misfits. There's a bunch of great pictures. She was just around. Um, really actually someone who I would love to interview Eileen Polk. She writes here, more people started to come over. And I knew that the English guy that came later on in the evening that brought Sid the dope, the English guy had really good dope. They started going, they started going in the bathroom and then Sid went in the bathroom when he came out. This So just, so just to set this up. This is a party that's taking place. Jerry only is there. Howie Pyro is with Jerry only. I believe Eileen Polk is there. Michelle, who is Sid's brief girlfriend before he died, uh, was there. A bunch of people were there. Um, I think Elliot kid was also there. Um, so that's what she's saying. So more people come over. Uh, an English guy had really good dope. They started going in the bathroom. Then Sid went in the bathroom when he came out. He turned all blue and white. So this is the night he died or uh, the, the, his last night on earth. We had to take blankets and wrap him up in them. Then he passed out on the bed and everybody was massaging him and shaking him. It was really kind of scary. And then he woke up and said, oh, wow, I'm sorry I scared you all. Howie Pyro and Jerry only and I were like, this is getting bad. Let's just leave. I just didn't want to be a part of a drug party because we really didn't want Sid doing drugs. We just wanted him to stay clean because he looks so much better after he'd been in jail. He looks so much better than he had been before. Elliot Kidd. It was obvious that I was going to live because Elliot talks about ODing the same night that Sid died. I could actually like walk, but I felt more like laying down. Sean said to me, if you lay down, make sure you lay down on your stomach because if you pass out and vomit, uh, if you're on your back, you'll you'll choke yourself to death, uh, which is what took Jimi Hendrix out. Not a drug overdose per se, but um, the choking on his own vomit. Um, also, Mama Cass, uh, Debbie. Uh, no, no. Um, uh, Janis Joplin. Debbie took me up to her apartment. Sheila lived on the sixth floor and Debbie lived on the 11th. Now it's morning, almost nine o'clock. Um, hold on, this is real quick. Debbie says, I'm going out to get breakfast for us. She leaves and all of a sudden I'm alone. I was so scared of passing out. I was thinking about what Sean said. So I go to the bathroom and I run my wrists under the freezing cold water and splash it on my face. Blah, 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 blah. She goes, Sid died. Okay, so this is really cutting back and forth. Here's Eileen Polk again. The, okay, here it is. The next day, Michelle called me at noon. She, she was crying. She said, Sid's dead. The first thing I thought was, she's hysterical. He's probably just sleeping. But I got dressed and I ran over there and I saw a crowd of reporters outside the apartment. When they saw me, they said, there's that girl from the courthouse. And then they all started taking my picture. I ran up to the door and the police let me in and I realized it was true. And Sid's mother, Anne was very good friends with the misfits. And Sid's mother and Michelle were sitting on the couch crying. But Anne always acted like she knew it was going to happen. She just didn't know when. Anne was also had a habit. 
she she also had a habit. Michelle was just hysterical. Everyone was getting really annoyed with her because she was so hysterical. She had only known Sid for two weeks at the most. So everyone was like, Michelle, please, you're going to drive his mother crazy. The poor woman's been through enough. Do you have to cause a scene? Then Anne told me what happened. She went to sleep on the couch in the living room. Sid had to show up for something the next morning. Uh, bail bond. I don't know. Something court related. She went to the bedroom around seven o'clock in the morning, tapped his shoulder and realized he was dead. Michelle was lying next to Sid in the bed. And then Anne woke Michelle up. It's possible he shot up more of the dope, but after overdosing, just falling asleep is enough to kill you. If you overdose, you have to drink lots of coffee and keep walking around to make sure it's out of your system because just falling asleep can slow your body down enough for your heart to fail. So it's possible that Sid might have taken one of Michelle's pills. He might have done more dope. He might have just fallen asleep. Apparently, the heroin that he had done was really pure, like 99%. That's what the cops told me. The, the police came back to the apartment and said, no, we need to take Anne and Michelle down. Do you mind staying here with the body and answering the telephone? So Eileen Polk had to stay there with the body. She was like, oh, okay. But the phone was in the bedroom and the body was in the bedroom. So I was just sitting there on the bed with Sid's body. I was in the bedroom for three hours with Sid dead and no one else was in the apartment. They sent for the body bag and everything, but it took a long time for them to come. Uh, I arrived at eight in the morning and it was dark by the time they removed the body. When Michelle and Anne were down at the police station, it was about six o'clock at night. And then I was left there from like six until nine and I answered the phone. And it was so disgusting because people were calling up with these fake British accents uh, and say they were related. Uh, and, oh, we just heard, and it would be the daily news. I, I'd always catch them uh, because I knew Sid's relatives' names. So I would say something like, oh, didn't you talk to his sister Susie? And they would say, oh, yes, we just talked to Susie, and then I'd hang up on them. New York Post, February 2nd, 1979, Sid Vicious is found dead. Punk rock star Sid Vicious is found dead in a green Gr Greenwich Village apartment in the apparent, um, I'm not going to say that word out loud, uh, ending of his life, uh, the police said today, the police said that Vicious, 21, apparently died of a heroin overdose and was found face up in the bed of a friend's apartment at 63 Bank Street. Uh, police say the apartment belonged to Michelle Robinson. The former pistol was released from jail yesterday on $50,000 cash bill, so he literally got out of jail and died. He had been jailed since December 8th when his bail on the charges, well, when his bail on the charges he murdered his girlfriend, Nancy Spongen, was revoked after he assaulted Patty Smith's brother in a Manhattan disco, which happened to be Max's Kansas City. He like cut up his cut up his hand. All right, here's the last part with Eileen Polk. I'm skipping over. Um I'm skipping over something, but uh Eileen Polk says, Anne started staying at my mom's house because she didn't want the press to know where she was. And I figured out it was the best place for her to go because they didn't know anything about me. All they knew was that I was a punk girl with blonde hair and they thought I was from England. So it was perfect. So after Sid died, Anne stayed at my house for two weeks and just drank the whole time and cried. We couldn't get a place to give us a funeral in New York without charging us like a zillion dollars because it was Sid vicious. It was hard because we wanted to find a nice burial place. So people could visit his grave. Instead, we ended up getting a place in New Jersey that cremated Sid, and then we took the ashes down to Philadelphia because Anne wanted to put them on Nancy's grave. When Sid was alive, he would always say, when I die, bury me next to Nancy. We wanted them to be together, so we called up Nancy's parents, and we asked if we can get a burial plot next to Nancy. They said no. Anne talked to them. She told Mrs. Spongen how much they really wanted to make friends with her because she felt that they were both in the same boat and that she felt really bad about the whole thing and that there were no hard feelings. But Mrs. Spongen was just like, okay, I'm not going to blame you, but just leave me alone. And now here's where Howie Pyro was around for this. So me and Howie Pyro and Jerry only and Anne and Anne's sister, Renee, drove down to Philadelphia to put Sid's ashes on Nancy's grave. On the way to the cemetery, we stopped because we wanted to see what the ashes were like before we got there. So we opened it up in the restroom of a mall we stopped at to get lunch. And it was really weird because I'm in this woman's bathroom with Anne and her sister and we're prying open Sid's ashes. We had never seen ashes before and they were really hard. 
it's like they compress them in this can, like an oil can, and you have to pry it open like one of those vacuum packed cans. They're packed solid. It's more like gravel than ashes. It was like a vacuum packed can of gravel, but it's bone and stuff like that morbid curiosity so we drove to philadelphia and when we got uh, and went to the graveyard we were escorted by two people who worked there and we said to them we just want to pay our last respects but they wouldn't leave us we had the ashes with us but we didn't want to tell them that we had the ashes with us because it's like a jewish sanctified ground because nancy was jewish and she was you can't have non-jews buried in your jewish cemetery whatever i'm not sure if that's true uh, that's what I'm Jewish. So I'm, not, I, I mean, I guess maybe, um, that's what they told us, but they didn't really want to have anything to do with Sid Vicious. That's what I'm saying. I'm not sure that that's true. We're standing at the gravesite and it was snowing. We're all crying. And we just said some prayers and left some flowers. Then we drove around to the other edge of the cemetery. We parked the car and, Anne took the ashes, went over to the fence, back to the gra gra uh, grave site and dumped Sid's ashes on Nancy's grave. Then she came back and got in the car and said, well, they're finally together. And that was that. Um, I wanted to read that because I just to set the scene for what is about to be said. Um, he says, he says, where does he say it? Oh, he says that I'm in P uh, PKM. Uh, I, he also writes for Ugly Things magazine, very famous magazine. Um, I wrote for fanzines like Flesh and Bones in the 80s. That's about all I can think of. And that's, I think that's him at the Ace. I think that's the Ace Hotel. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yes, it's true. Many, many are gone. Um, Rue says, this is true. My brother is buried on the other side of Joey Cemetery. Oh, I did not know that. That's in Patterson, right? Patterson, New Jersey. We were just talking about it yesterday, that place. Um, your brother is in the same place as Joey Ramon. Um, sorry to hear about that. Sorry to hear that. Um, okay. This one is, oh my God, this is super long. No. But it's got a lot of really good pictures. This is actually short. This is called Art and Life with Howie Pyro. Let's take a look. Okay, thank you. Hilda says that's the Tiki Oasis. Thank you. I I truly didn't know. I appreciate you uh, filling us in, uh, Hilda. Thank you for that. Um, I do not know much about much about that place. Ben says, thank you so much for this tribute, Jeff. My wife and I met Harry Pyro in 20, 2009, and we loved him so much. He was such a special person. Listen, don't thank me. Thank let's. We should thank all the people that wrote all these wonderful things. I did not personally know Howie uh, at all. I just wanted to pay. I just wanted to do a show about him, I guess. I don't know. I feel like we should we should really say thank you to everybody, but I appreciate the sentiment, Ben. Um, oh, it's Hillside Lynnhurst. Thank you, Rue. Thank you. Everybody's correcting me today. I'm not, not, on, not on my game. All right, so this is called Art and Life with Howie Pyro. Today, we'd like to introduce you to Howie Pyro. Howie, please kick things off by telling us about yourself and your journey so far. He said, um, it's more of the same. I left home at 15 years of age from Queens, New York, and headed to the Lower East Side of Manhattan and witnessed the dawn of the punk rock movement. I became one of the youngest musicians on the scene with my first band, The Blessed, formed in 1977. I went on to play and record and write with, we, we've heard all these names before. Um, I did not know this. He also um, collaborated with The Gun Club uh, and Kid Congo Powers. Uh, with my 90s band, D-Gen, I toured, D-Generation, I toured with everyone from the Ramones to Kiss to Green Day, Social Distortion. I've also done music supervision work for films and TV, and I'm a well-known disc jockey. I have a radio show called, we, we already know the, all this stuff. Um, I've had a 10-year-long, so far, weekly residency at the Ace Hotel in Palm Springs in downtown LA and have DJed for, for, uh, for everyone from the Cramps live shows to Christina Aguilera on her 21st birthday party to uh, Genesis P. Orridge's uh, induction into Santarian priesthood. Interesting. 
fashion shows and Hollywood celebrity events like the premiere party for Mad Men TV, Christian Dior, uh, Sundance Film Festival, Blue Man Group. Wow. Lots and lots and lots of stuff. Um, as well as notable clubs such as Max's Kansas City and the Mud Club to the Viper Room and the Chateau Marmot. He he really, he saw such a slice of history, man. Um, he 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 uh, he co-created one of the longest running dance parties, which was Green Door uh, NYC. And it's funny because there was Green Door NYC and then now there's something called the Red Party, which is like a post-punk death rock goth sort of thing. Ben says, I really hope Glenn plays Naked Witch tomorrow. That song has Howie's fingerprints all over it. It's got to be his idea. I do know that uh, Glenn around that time, uh, Glenn. Okay, here's one thing that Howie is responsible for. Howie's favorite movie. Okay, so so here's here's something that Howie is responsible for within Misfits lore and Misfits history. Um, Howie was apparently the inspiration or at least the, uh, um, the, 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 the motivation behind Glenn writing the song horror hotel, which is based on a horror movie and Howie in the seventies in the, I think in 79, maybe 80 went to Glenn and said, can you write a song about horror hotel? And Glenn did. And we have the song horror hotel because of Howie Pyro. So thank you for that, Howie Pyro. Um, <laughs> boy, he really hates Rudy Giuliani. I mean, I hate Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani too. Um, but he really blames. I mean, he he he's he really uh, roasts him over the coals any chances he, he gets. Uh, can you give our readers some background on your art? I'm not an artist in the classical sense. So I move through all the artistic disciplines without any form of discipline of my own. I feel that I am my art in the way that I have internalized my art and others to the point where I can't see the separation line between myself and it. I have done art. I come from artists and my sister has been a lifetime artist, commercial and otherwise. I love finding artists, uh, pushing them to people that would appreciate it working on books. Now, here's the thing. I, I So I guess, so he had written a bunch of books, but he never wrote a book about his life. Maybe there's a manuscript out there somewhere, somewhere. Um, he says, I'm a big collector and pretty much live in a museum. I do art more when challenged than it, as a way to express myself. I love so many creative outlets that I don't feel the need to distinguish one from the other, which is why I say I am my art. It's not a hobby. I don't work at a bank and escape from my dreary existence on the weekend with my toys. I'd be dead if I ever entered into reality like that. I have spent every waking hour of my life pursuing my obsessions, which is an art in and of itself. That's beautiful, man. My obsessions are the other things that um the art music books films trinkets collectibles all pop culture oriented but the overlooked of all these subjects due to the nature of collecting and digging and unearthing as time goes on collectors who have collected everything that has been discussed and written about and all the other ones that exploit collectors seeking something else to repackage and sell it's inevitable that the layers are peeled away over time, and we see more and more obscure art, music, films, in order just to experience something for the first time again, that first rush. For whatever reason, even as a child, I seem to start at this point instead of the other way around like many others, making discoveries, putting the puzzles together, as I always say. As I spend all these years, I, as I spend all these years, I started, I start to see reoccurring names faces, places, and I have connected the dots and realized that many unknown histories where there are no dots previously at all, uh, and this is the payoff. Um, so much has been explained by doing these puzzles. This is possibly the most fulfilling art of mine. I hope to reconnect unknown bizarre geniuses with their art. 90% of these people are long dead and never knew or cared about what I consider their art. And never knew or cared about what I consider their art. 
not always, but many of the time when you find these people, they are embarrassed about their younger years when they did what was supposed to what was supposedly thrown away and forgotten. I'm not alone in these uh, endeavors, but I was the first, at least as far as I knew. When I first left home, I started meeting the people that would become my chosen family, the first wave of the New York punk rock people, meaning artists, musicians, photographers, promoters, club owners, DJs, and uh, talking in the night to sunrise about my obsessions, learning theirs that I hadn't come across yet. I realized at this point that I wasn't alone. And in the last 42 years, an entire world has created itself revolving around this stuff. Companies like Norton Records, Something Weird Video, the hundreds of fanzines, books, videos that have shown the unknown history, the flip side of pop culture will always have people at the edge of their seats. In your view, what is the biggest issue artists have to deal with? The internet, says Howie, it's made people lazy and it's stopped people from mingling and going to see art in person, which is really the only way to see art, experience the power of music, see films, etc. Besides the besides that, things are so scattered and unfocused again due to the internet, in my opinion, as people scan through whatever happens to be in front of them at the moment and then move on. It's easy to collect followers on Instagram but how many will show up for your show? Um, and then he says, what's the best way for someone to check out your work and provide support? So the, the archive of Howie's radio show, which I know he did one very recently before he passed away. Here we go. I'm going to put this link in the comments for anybody real quick. But a boom. Thank you for deleting that, Rue. And thank you for the alert, Aaron, as well. Um, so check that out. Check that out right there. There's Howie looking cool, eating records. These are just a bunch of photos of How Howie. Look at that. Look at his look at his house, man. It it literally is a museum. And he's just into all this really cool stuff. Um about a year ago, I was doing a video on Scream Jay Hawkins, and I was trying to track down his first uh, appearance in a film that he was Mr. Rock and Roll, which stars Alan Freed. Uh, Scream Jay Hawkins was in a very sort of like racist role, and he was um, he was cut. He was cut from the, the the movie. I was trying to find more information about it, and um, how he kind of helped me out with that, and I really appreciated that. I was asking him questions; he was able to answer. Here's here's Howie with Joey Ramone and Joe Strummer. So cool. What a life. That's cool. Look at this werewolf, dude. Um, that's Howie in Danzig. That's that 666 space we were talking about. DJing, records, all that stuff. Um, let's see what the next one is. Oh, this is a big one. I don't know if, oh man, holy moly. What, how, oh, we've already been going for almost 90 minutes. Let me see here. Oh, that is, we might have to do a part two. We might. Uh, now, I want to quickly touch on Howie's band after. Well, here's the Blessed. We were talking about the Blessed. So here is the Blessed. This is the blessed. I hope this doesn't get this show flagged. We'll, we'll see. Um, this is the blessed doing a song at Great Gildersleeves. Uh, do, this is a blessed reunion from 1983. They were, and this is posted by uh, Nicholas Petty, who was in the blessed. He's like the last living member of the blessed. Uh, the Beastie Boys asked the blessed to get back together, so they did in 1983. And here it is. I'll, I'll play some of the uh, play some of it. What's up, Jody Ramone? Jody, Ram Jody Ramone is in the house, and he says, I'm sorry to hear. I'm sorry I'm rather late. Howie, may you rock in peace. Word, bird. Bird is the word of Bama um, Umau Mau. All right, here we go. Let's, let's play this for, for just a little bit. Hear what the blessed sound like. This is from 1983. Howie's about uh, maybe like 23 years old in this clip. Can you hear it okay? Yeah. 
great uh, great Gildersleeve was another um, venue. I think that was on the Bowery. Great Gildersleeves. Aaron, I just came back from Doctor Strange. It was really fun. Right, let's see if we can... There they are. There's Billy. There's Howie. That's definitely not Walter Lewis, though. That's someone else on guitar, I think. Who is that? Oh, God, man. Look how young Billy looks there. Howie. Howie. Howie can also be heard in... Um, Howie can be seen again with the Mystics in the earliest circulating Mystics footage out there from 1979 called um, uh, Studio Zero. Here's... Let's let's show that actually too. So here's how he playing the peppermint twist with Jerry only and Glenn Danzig. Hold on. Um, let me find it. It's probably under the misfits. <laughs> misfits peppermint twist. Uh <laughs> it's pretty sloppy, but fun. How ha how Howie is a ball of energy rolling around on the floor. Here it's less. Let's twist again the peppermint twist. Ready? This is great. I love. The, I never get tired of looking at this. Never get tired of looking at this. Hold on one second. This is only two minutes. Here we go. Ready? Here it is. But uh, bomb. There we go. Um, hopefully it loads. You hear that okay? That's Howie. That's Howie in the pink shirt having a fit. Oh, come on. Stupid bandwidth. Oh, this is really bad. Boo! Let's, come on. Come on, come on. Here, let me let it load for a second. Heart there, there's Jerry right there. All right, ready? I'm gonna let it play. Yes, I agree. Look at Jerry. There's Glenn playing guitar, and how he's just rolling around on the floor like a nut. That's when they were really good friends. The, all those guys, those three guys, were really good friends. Uh, Howie, Jerry, and Glenn. And this is Studio Zero Nine Seven Nine. They also played uh, "I Want to Be Your Dog" at one point. Look at look at Jerry like actually plucking the strings on his bass. And his loafers. <laughs> Glenn's having a good Glenn, Glenn's having a good time. <laughs> I don't know who the other two guys are, though. I think, actually, maybe Bobby Snots is there from the uh, Horlords. Is that Bobby Snots? Might be. Oh, it's so choppy. It's so hard to do playback footage on um, Melon Studios. I hate it. Really annoying. <clears throat> it's just coming up choppy, isn't it? At least the audio is working. Well, that's it. <laughs> Look at 
Howie's face. Um, so there's the next, that's the next part. So then, uh, there's this, okay. So here's, this is cool. This is called, um, the Atlee. Is this the Atlee Willis museum of kitsch for those kitsch is like camp, like that sort of thing. And Howie was a, was a contributor here. And so he, he would, you know, how he would go to like various different, like, you know, garage sales or whatever, stuff like that. And he would post his findings here. So these are all of his findings. I'm going to put this in the uh, chat. You should check this out. This is just an example of all the stuff that Howie was into, right? I'm going to make this smaller so you can see. Uh, stuff like double takes mod, very um, winking eye necklaces, uh, mod psychedelic ice bucket. And he like has like a little like blurb for each one. I also scored two of these, which are large and really great in person in great packaging. I recently got this ice bucket. I've been eyeing at a friend's place for years. One side has the man's face, the other dot, dot, dot. So it like kind of like um, gives a good description of stuff. Uh, a beatnik garbage can, Schaefer beer sign. He's just into all sorts of nutty stuff. You know, um, three channel psychedelic control center. I'm so obsessed with this. It always freaks people out. Whoa, what does that do? Honestly, I don't really know. An albino squirrel holding a rosary and a glass bubble. Like he just collected weird stuff. I love it. I love this stuff psycho ceramics here is one shelf the wrestling guy doesn't count nor do the little devils at the bottom right um there are bums covered in rhinestone uh the drunk drunken shriners this is one of a kind thrift store think rather large thin rather large they're handmade and nailed to a board uh, he just he just loved kitsch that's what he loved a rat clock, nothing to do with the other post dealing with the rat's hole in Daytona Beach. This is a large wall clock from some exterminating company. Germs. This is a great pointless late 70s, early 80s toy store filler that is not referencing the punk band of the same name. He just loved this stuff, man. Glamour lashes. Hollywood cesspool, a wonderful book about a wonderful town. I love religious rants about anything to do with pop culture, whether it be backward masking, satanic carpenters re records or any, or against Hollywood. Uh, Jane Mansfield's comb. He says, well, I have been on a comb and Jane entry thingy here. I found, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what he's saying. A beatnik beach towel. Jane Mansfield, hot water bottle. Um, Phyllis Diller's Philly Dilly Chicken Chili. Say that again. <laughs> Phyllis Diller's Philly Dilly Chicken Chili. He says, another wonderful and bizarre item I just came across at the supermarket in the 80s. Wow, I love Phyllis Diller. That's amazing. He's just got tons of these posts, tons of them. Uh, monstrously good salt and pepper shakers. Uh, pulling teeth snap in tooth puzzle. Another great bathroom wall item. This hangs closer to the big mirror. I have been tempted for years to give this thing to my dentist. Oh, that's funny, man. And there's just, he's got like, it just goes on and on. Um, But he just, he loved that stuff. That was such a, that was a big part of his life. As I said, it was on the hoarders episode. So I would feel remiss if we didn't talk about that in talking about Howie Pyro's really great life. Then he did a band called the Freaks or Freaks. And here's a little blurb about them. There's really not a lot about Freaks at all. Very hard to find info. Uh, here's a review from 2012. This is the Joyful Gadfly Rock and Metal Album Review Blog. Um, so Howie Pyro's Freaks, Heavy Orange, Hippie Skelter, a rock opera in five movements, EP album review. The degeneration comes of age. The style is hard rock, experimental punk, 
alt rock self-released in 1988 when they disbanded and they were in new york city so howie didn't really do much music for almost 10 years and then he came back with this band and then that led him into the 90s kind of um members howie pyro bass and backing vocals uh big mama freak matthews his rhythm guitar and vocals that was was married to howie john fay was lead guitar backing vocals and eric eckley was drums i never want to grow up neither do i um kids are more fun than grown-ups we do not have to grow up if we don't want to we can take some magic i have for that uh crum crum crumulus pills comes a conversation between pippi longstocking and her friend anika Opening this bizarre, obscure collector's item from the bassist of the New York Hard Rockers D Generation. Right. That was that's like a recording, like a from a, an old show. The voiceover, taken from one of the many Pippi Longstocking movies, eventually is joined by a guitar fading in, bringing another bubbly mix of indecipherable incantations and studio effects. That is nothing less than an acid laced musical alice in wonderland as she falls through the rabbit hole thus is the strange five song rock opera about pippi longstocking her friend anika and according to their later interviews with pyro a link to charles manson though not outside of the title uh that link is a bit hard to discern that um the link might not be a literary one but a figurative one as freaks is an authentic jump back to a psychedelic 1970s when punk is beginning its crawl through the underground sewers if it wasn't for the date on the album released on only handmade cassettes one would have no inkling that it is from the age of motley crew motley crew and guns and roses freaks was a retro rock outing uh here in all its lo-fi glory lastly barely over a year lasting barely over a year with pyro his future wife to be nicknamed big mama freak due to this project and who would later find fame with the flesh tones her cousin on drums and a friend on lead guitar it was about an experience over anything that had long-term uh, commercial potential Freaks called up the spirit of Blue Cheer, the MC5, and the Stooges, and they would release only two singles, the album In Surround Sound and this little experiment lasting only but a fourth of the cassette. It may not be the most musically coherent album Pyro has been involved with, but it's one of those little obscure releases that drives collectors and fans crazy. This one even more so as the information about it is rare, let alone bootleg recordings nearly non-existent. It's certainly one of Pyro's most ambitious projects. And while the album might include too many voiceovers from the movie, um, have disastrous nonsensical lyrics elsewhere, like when is the cow going to eat your yellow shirt? Um, blazing guitar solos destroyed by the voiceovers and weird sound effects and bad and a bad acapella piece. Uh, for example, heart is where is what we're made out of. When the band gets down to playing, they're actually they actually turn into a great. Uh, blah, blah, blah. When the band gets down to playing, they actually turn in, in a great punk-driven album. This is the case of a band lost underneath its own art. But it should be said for a band that didn't hide the fact that too many drugs were involved in the making of this recording. The songs are pieced together quite well with many layers, showing some dedicated and thought out work while the vision itself has merit even if the outcome is too psychedelic for its own good bonus points for trying to sound like it was made 20 years earlier than it was in british english the term helter skelter has its meaning of indisorderly haste or confusion pyro got that right so that's the band freak freaks who knows if it'll ever be uh, properly released or reissued. I have to lean back because my back is hurting me. And that brings us to, let's see here. That brings us to our final piece. Okay, here I'm leaning back, giving myself. This is, oh God, this is really long. I don't know if I can do this right now. I'm like kind of dead. Um, Ah, oh man, but these stories are like, they, this is like the meat of Howie Pyro. These are the story. I mean, these are the these are the great stories. 
Um, all right, let's give it a shot. Whew. All right. Ready? Ready, set, steady. My Lord. My Lord. Oh, it, it's long. It's too friggin' long, dude. Um, No, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. This is from Legsville, Legs McNeil. Okay, wow, you have the surround sound album. Uh, and Angie has the surround sound album. That's awesome. This is from Legs McNeil's new website. We just were reading from Legs McNeil's book, PKM. Um, now he has a website called Legsville, and this was an interview that he had done with Howie from a while back. Here's the thing, though. And this is important to note. Howie uh, saw that Legs posted this on Facebook and was not pleased with the way that this came out. I don't know if it was ever corrected, but it's important to note that Howie was not pleased with the final. Things were not in proper context. So I just want to say, take that with a grain of salt. But I mean, these are very complete Howie Pyro stories and really sort of um, exemplify his interactions and, and whatnot. Um, thanks for dropping in, Ace. Uh, much appreciated. Angie says it was uh, the Freaks album was on a little New York label called Resonance. Thank you for that, Angie. In honor of Howie Pyro's new liver and Jesse Mallon's benefit show for Howie's medical expenses on Saturday, March 5th at the Troubadour in Los Angeles, I present Howie Pyro, the East Village Zelig, founding member of both the Blessed and D generation. Howie played bass with Joey Ramone. Uh, it says the Misfits. That's not true. And Danzig. And for the first time speaks in his own words about what was like life like in the bad old days. So here's the first story about The Dictators, a phenomenal band. If you don't have never listen to Dictators Girl Go Crazy, you should. Um, I love The Dictators. I was fortunate. I'm so grateful that I got to see them live. We had actually Andy Chernoff from The Dictators um, did an interview, Pizza Punk interview. He's like the third episode. Check that out. Hi Pyro says, I mean, most people's musical tastes at 14 years old aren't that well-developed, but I saw the dictators when I was 14 at my junior high school in Whitestone, Queens, where I grew up. It was sort of by chance that I saw the dictators. You know, it just came about, but I had never really heard of them before, nor had anyone. It was their third gig, and their first two gigs were like opening for like REO Speedwagon and someone else, and both gigs were really bad where they were booed off the stage. It's worth noting that the dictators, when Legs was sort of like coining the term punk, the dictators and the Ramones were the bands he was thinking of. The dictators, the stuff that they were writing about um, in their songs sort of, you know, helped to sort of classify this counterculture music that was really happening because there was no like formula or sound. It was just, it was more of a scene. Punk rock was more of a scene than it was a, a sound, you know, and that's why all the bands, you have so many bands that sounded so different because of that. And the Dictators gig at my junior high school, this was their first absolutely great experience. They brought a million bags of White Castle. Yeah, they loved White Castle. They loved White Castle from the Bronx. And they just pummeled the audience with White Castle hamburgers. That would be great. Uh, the uh, the entire show. Man, I wish I'd asked Andy about that. It became like a giant food fight. It was all young kids my age, and it was just the greatest thing ever. They were amazing. It was my first like extreme experience. You know what I mean? My only other experience was my guitar teacher, and this is also really weird. I had a guitar teacher, and his name was Mike Pardow, and he lived nearby, and my dad would drop me off for my guitar lessons in Queens, and he had bands. He was around from before, and he had hung out with the New York Dolls at the Mercer Art Center before 
So in like 72, I think, I'm not sure if it was in 71, but in 72, the Mercer Art Center was the place to be. It's no longer around. It was torn down. But that's where that was like where the New York Dolls would hold kind of like a residencies there. You know, they play there often. That's where the New York Dolls kind of like rose up as well as Max's Kansas City. And he said, uh, so he was around for that, for the Mercer Art Center and all that stuff. As a matter of fact, what was that HBO show that like kind of details like punk? Uh, it was around. It was on for two seasons, and they they show the Mercer Arts. They show the New York Dolls playing in the Mercer Arts Center, and and it's very dramatized. The the ceiling crumbles as they're playing Personality Crisis. Um, so he was into all that stuff, and I was like, wow, wow, wow. And he had old pictures of him, and he used to look like David Bowie. And he was like the freak of the neighborhood. So he was just the guitar teacher and he smoked Salem's, which is how I started smoking Salem's, which is what you smoke legs, legs, note used to smoke. Um, Mike Parda was really cool and he wasn't going to make me play, you know, row, row, row your boat. We were immediately to vicious by Lou Reed. Vicious. You hit me with the bow. Great, great song off of the album Transformer by Lou Reed, although I am partial to Berlin. Um, but you really have to be in a good mindset to, to, to listen to Berlin because you will like want to kind of die. Um, I was terrible in high school, even though I was very smart. I couldn't handle it. I just got into this program. This is another good story, actually. It all leads to it's It's really funny. I've never even put th these three stories together, actually. I was put in this program where you go to school a week and you work a week. It was like a program for bad kids, kind of, you know. I got a job on Wall Street packing boxes or something. They get you a job. So I was like going to the city, which is what Manhattan is called, if you're from Queens or Brooklyn or Long Island. I was going to the city for a whole week at a time to go to this job. It was really cool. I met my black counterpart, and there was another kid who was my age who lived in the Bronx. And I was telling him about punk rock. This was really, really early in punk rock. Like maybe television single came out on Orc Records. So that might be 1973, 1974. Okay, never mind. I'm corrected. I'm looking at the next paragraph. He says, this was already late 1975, like maybe into 1976. And my black counterpart was telling me about the hip hop guys in the city. And we were both in the same stages. And we were telling each other about stuff we'd heard. It was really amazing, you know. Like we were telling each other the stuff that we had witnessed because back then it was in a schoolyard or between the projects. Kids, we're doing it and talking about it. So I heard about hip hop and rap like Africa, Bombada and whoever, you know what I mean? They were talking about these people and this was really amazing. Here's a picture of the blessed. And this is, and I think this is Nick here and he's the only one who's still alive. The, all these guys are gone. These three dudes I interviewed for the doc, for the project, they're all in the movie and they're, they've, they've been documented. Wow. Look at them. All gone, man. It's crazy. Max's Kansas City. I let him. I, blah, 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 blah. So here's Howie talking about Max's Kansas City. I met a lot of people my age in the first two months when I left home. And then they all just made bands. We made a band. All those kids were not going out. We just met kids in the street. We were acting like we were home. We were just roaming the streets of the East Village all day and hanging out at Bleaker Bob's and going from here to there. I had that thing where I was reading rock scene and I wasn't old enough to go into the clubs. I was peeking in the window at Max's Kansas City. And when I go to the Palladium to see a concert and make friends, I'd walk a, a few blocks up the street to Max's so I could go look in the window of this place I had been reading about in rock scene. So I had this weird fantasy thing about it. When I finally decided I'm going in, which is also really weird because I decided I was going in, they let me in. It was the last thing that I had expected. I was just like, wow, this is weird. Nothing has ever come up to that feeling of walking into Max's the very first time. It was insane. It was really science fiction-like. Really, it was the most unreal thing. I walked in and I felt like I had found it. 
Nobody feels this. People go their whole life without ever feeling this feeling. But I found it. I totally found it. And it was much more than I had expected. I was in ecstasy, real ecstasy. Like I was speechless. I don't know if anyone else ever really felt like what I'm saying, because what I'm trying to say is almost indescribable. I suddenly realized that everything that happened before didn't matter. And all the horrible things that had happened in my life were over, which wasn't true. But at that moment, I just felt perfect. This is exactly where I belong, what I've been looking for and dreaming of my whole life. Blondie was playing with the cramps and suicide. Oh, didn't mean to say that word. And Blondie had this whole girl group thing and all that stuff. Right. They were originally called like Angel or something. Uh, and he says, and Deborah, and he says, and Debbie Harry was always so and still is exactly the same. Totally sweet, not affected, you know. She always remembered my name and knew who I was and was really fucking nice and just so beautiful and talented and perfect. It's hard to believe someone like that existed. Blondie just had a weird magic about them. The cramps were the cramps. They were fucking fantastic. Lux and Ivy and not realizing it at the time, but in retrospect, it's kind of funny how not cutting edge they were in a weird way. I mean, they were, of course, but they played all these 50s songs that I had collected as singles when I went to flea markets when I was a kid, and then they became cramp songs, and then they started that whole rockabilly revival. Um, S-U-I-C-I-D-E, as insane as that thing was, was hair-raising and the loudest thing ever. But it's like rockabilly, almost. The band was great and amazing and funny. They had a lot in common. Everyone had a lot in common, you know? What he's talking about, what he's describing when he talks about this stuff, he found community. He found community in, in a place where people were doing things that inter interested him, things that, that he found people that were doing the same things that interested him, basically, you know? It, and it goes to this adage, this very old adage of like, like create the fellowship that you crave, right? Like, or if it doesn't exist or just go where your water level is at, that's ultimately what's being described here. Um, so for a while, as we mentioned before, uh, Howie Pyro worked at Manic Panic. On one of the days that I'd come out of work on Wall Street, I was walking down St. Mark's Place and Trash and Vaudeville was open. So, of course, I had to go in there. And in the early punk days, there was only Trash and Vaudeville and The Late Show, which was just like old clothes. But they played cool music there. And we heard we had heard that the New York Dolls used to rehearse in the basement and blah, 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 blah. So it was cool. And Frenchie worked there and he was cool and he knew the Dolls and we liked him. And he was like a weird guy. Then next door is Trash and Vaudeville. And in the early punk days, they had the whole store and the downstairs was a pinball arcade. So we'd go down there and hang out and then we'd go upstairs and the register back then was on the right side in the cubby hole. So you had to leave your bags, but it's not there anymore. And now, you know, and now, I mean, trash and vaudeville lasted so long. Uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, Jimmy Webb, uh, who passed away, um, who, who knew everybody kind of like the way how he knew everybody. Uh, and, you know, trash and vaudeville really stayed on St. Mark's. They were one of the last things to go. Um, and now it's just un, unrecognizable how he says here. And one day I was walking down the street and there was this new store just opening, literally just opening. And I looked, I wandered in there and it was called manic panic and they were putting a sign up. They had all this weird stuff in there. And I just, I just wandered in there and I was just standing in there and I was like, this is so cool. You know what I mean? They were just really nice and still are talking about Tish and Snooki. 
I wound up being their first employee, and that was the divining moment. Tish and Snooky were great people, really nice and sweet, you know. Besides everything else, once they gave me the job, I think I was paid $6 a day, but they let me sleep in the back, which was horribly scary. There were just all kinds of giant water bugs and stuff. I tried to make a line of chairs and sleep on the chairs. Just having a place to go and being paid six bucks a day, which acts, which absolutely took care of my life's expenses, was great. And being in there, that's where the Dead Boys connection really originally came because they were because when they first moved to New York, that's where everyone went. Uh, Revenge wasn't even opening yet. Uh, uh, there was nothing. And I believe revenge that's Natasha's store or Natasha used to work at revenge. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I think she, I think she owned revenge too. So I started the band, the blessed with excessive and this guy, Nick Berlin and Billy Stark, but we kicked excessive out before we ever played. And he wound up in Richard Hell and the voidoids. I don't know. We didn't get along teenage stuff. I don't remember what it was. We just didn't get along. None of us knew how to play except for him, actually. So they kicked out the one guy who who actually knew how to play. We had tapes that don't exist anymore, uh, which I wish they did. Nick's playing drums on a cardboard box and a hanger. It was like that. I was the oldest one. Nick was three years younger than me. Nick was 13. So um, so how he's 16 at this time, this girl, Eileen lived upstairs from manic panic. Uh, that's Eileen Polk. Um, and we would stay up there too. I learned a lot up there, not about SCX, but about music. She would leave us alone up there and let us stay there. So we'd go through her records. She had the 13 floor elevators and all this stuff. That's when I first heard the first 13 floor elevators and Nick knew about it because Nick grew up as a baby in Texas. Nick from the blessed and his mother they, that we were just watching his YouTube channel. Uh, they lived with the 13 floor elevators. Nick talked about them a lot. And I always thought that was weird. And Janis Joplin was his babysitter. You know, all this kind of crazy, crazy Austin shit. His mother was in the hog farm and they moved to California and then to New York. Here's a picture of how he nestled with a bottle and a furry vest on and weird striped pants. Great fashion sense. Really cool fashion sense right there okay so now here here we are with punk magazine i can't even explain my reaction to punk magazine it didn't make any sense because it was so childlike and aimed at kids and like a comic book we were all just like ah everyone was like that that was into it it was just preposterous that it even existed you know what i mean it made no sense it was just like oh my god this is insane this is like a comic book with Lou Reed on the cover. What the fuck? This is so weird and great. You know what I mean? I still have all the actual ones that I bought then, you know, just reading them over and over and over again. That was another thing. Just like all those other things. We were just so starved for anything. Like if you would have put them out like twice a week, you would have sold them out because people were just like, more, more, more. It was few and far between when they came out, which made it more in retrospect, like a holy grail kind of thing. I remember when the new one came out. Wow. You know, uh, got the same kind of feeling, even though it was 25 years later. But I mean, it was just like weird, 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 weird. You could see it as it was happening. You know what I mean? Even the shittiest, not that it was, but even if it was the shittiest worst magazine, something that warrants a magazine even existing, you know, but the fact that it was unbelievably great was like even weirder and it was a comic book and it was mean and funny and it had all these in jokes and all this stupid stuff. And it was a small neighborhood with a local thing. And it worked on both levels, like the little rascals or certain cartoons that you could watch with your parents. Someone in England could read it and get it. But then, you know, all the New Yorky little jokes might go over their head and they wouldn't know what it meant, but it didn't matter. And it was really smart. There was a lot of really smart stuff about it. And when people all over the world read it, it started its own cool world. That magazine was the first one, the first fanzine. You know how many fanzines there are? Hundreds of thousands. Even within the first four years of Punk Magazine coming out, now there's whole books of them. That, there's a collected book of the Punk issues, which I have right over there. Um, it's great. 
even with the first four years of punk magazines coming out now there's whole books of them it's crazy there's websites I, I, i'll look on the websites and there's like a, a million of them that i had never even seen or heard of what i like about punk magazine was it was very readable totally readable and everybody read punk cover to cover. Absolutely. It wasn't too much money either. It was just enough. And the letters were big and every single thing in it was funny and warranted being there. There was no filler and there was no, it was absolutely the perfect thing, but it was also printed. You didn't feel like it was some cheapy thing like all those other fanzines. Uh, that was the one big different thing about it, that it, it that it was completely different about that. It that was completely different about it than all those other fan scenes. Uh, there's Howie with his bass. It says, blessed be Johnny Ramone. So here's Howie talking. How, so here's Howie Pyro talking about his relationship with Johnny Ramone. I became very close with Johnny Ramone. And that was kind of weird because no one else was really friends with him except me and this guy, Craig, who I knew was into movies. And Johnny had the first beta videotape machine that I had ever seen. And all these videos started coming out. Me and Johnny, and I don't remember how he met really, but I know I went to get their autograph at Free Being Records. I still have the Leave Home album, and like 14 people were there at Free Being Records. It was no big deal to me. It's in my diary. Joey Ramone said I was the first person to ask him for an autograph. At some point, Johnny Ramone and I became friends, probably just from the neighborhood because he lived on 12th Street and we started talking about movies and we really became friends and we stayed friends up until his death, you know, really, really, really close friends. I'd go to Johnny's house every day when I wasn't working and he would save up the movies and we'd watch them together. He had Blood Feast and oh my God, none of us had ever seen these movies because they never played in the Northeast. They only, uh, they were only played in drive-ins in the South. We had been hearing about them and reading about them. All these crazy movies that I had just been fantasizing about. They were the exact same. These movies were a total parallel line to the music and Max's and the rock scene. You know what I mean? I was just an insatiable, uh, sorry, I was just an insatiable knowledge fiend. And I was really into seeing these movies, but that's what we did. We just watched movies all day. Then Johnny would tell me weird stuff about Joey Ramone and we would follow him. I couldn't talk about this when Johnny and Joey were alive. I mean, people were writing books on the Ramones, so I had to skip this whole thing. But Johnny would tell me that Joey was a Siamese twin and we would have to follow him around so we could watch Joey because I wasn't really friends <clears throat> because I wasn't really friends with Joey yet. But you have to picture this. It was like the Three Stooges or the Marx Brothers or something. Me and Johnny, we'd go to the corner and wait for Joey to come out of his building on 11th Street. Johnny and I would act like we were just going to have pizza on St. Mark's, but we were just waiting for Joey to come out of his building, just waiting like spies. And Johnny's like, here he comes, here he comes. And I was like, okay. And Johnny's like, watch, watch, watch. And Joey would do one of his OCD things on the curb. And Johnny would say, see, see, he's a Siamese twin. I told you he's a Siamese twin. The Ramones were so crazy. It was hysterical. Yeah, Joey Ramone had, you know, there was no name for OCD, right? Like there was no name for it at the time, but he had essentially undiagnosed OCD his whole life. And it made diff it made touring difficult for the Ramones at times because he'd have to do all these these rituals. Monty Melnick talks about it in his book on the road with the Ramones. You should all check that book out or check out the interview I did with Monty Melnick. We would go on to the corner and Joey was coming and we would both be like peeking around the corner. Johnny's head in my head, peeking around the corner, keeping track of everywhere Joey went. It was nuts. So Johnny was obsessed with Joey. They were still friends, but he was into the fact that Joey was such a freak. They were friends though. This was before any of that bad stuff. It was just funny. And the bad stuff he's referring to is when uh, Johnny uh, took up with Linda who is Joey's girlfriend, and she eventually would become Linda Ramone. I really don't know about when Johnny started seeing Linda Ramone. 
uh, when she was still uh, still with Joey. I don't think I did, even though I was really good friends with Linda separately, even from all of them, actually. I go out to her house in Long Island, and I'm still good friends with her. I don't think I knew, probably because at that point we weren't hanging out as often, me and Johnny. So he's basically saying, I, I didn't know when that whole thing started up. Roxy and Ramon, Johnny's girlfriend, I'm not even going to start on her. She was crazy. She would sexually attack me when Johnny would go to the bathroom. And I was like, he's in the bathroom. Um, and Johnny did some pretty uh, pretty unforgivable, uh, irrehensible things to Roxy. Something like... I, I don't know. He like tied her to a chair. I heard all sorts of horror stories about that. I always loved Linda Ramon who became Johnny's wife. I will always defend her to the end. She is true to herself. She has never changed for anyone. Linda is true to her thing. She is exactly the same as she was in 1976. She's super cool and funny, and she's got a mean sense of humor. My whole aesthetic or anti-aesthetic really comes from Johnny Ramon. He told me that his guitar was under his bed, and that is where it stayed. We looked under the bed, and he goes, that's where the guitar stays unless I'm working. I was like, wow. And I'm exactly the same way. I never picked up my bass in the house unless I had to learn something or write something. I have always been that way. That is totally my aesthetic musically. Retiring, or whatever you want to call it from music, was also very pleasurable for me like it was for Johnny Ramon. But what's interesting is Johnny Ramon essentially somewhat retired. He lived he lived eight years after he retired. If he had kept going in the Ramones, would he have lived longer? Did the touring like wear Johnny Ramon out to a point? I think I asked this to, to Monty as well. You know, the idea that that Johnny you know, all those guys that they, you know, they got cancer from just being on the road that like wore them out or something. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. Here's um, here's a pic of Howie with uh, Jesse Mallon, probably in the uh, degeneration days, right? Johnny Thunders. Johnny. Th so here's Howie Pyro talking about his relationship with Johnny Thunders of the New York Dolls and Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. Johnny Thunders was my idol. The first time I met Johnny was upstairs at Max's early on, and it's a really weird story. I had found this watch, this really cool watch that was like a mod red and white design. And I was upstairs at Max's and Johnny was up there and he was like, wow, that's cool. Let me see that watch. He's looking at it and then he's saying, hey, you should give me that watch. I'm like, no. And I pulled away. He's like, fuck you, man. Um, Johnny play. I mean, what like a that's such like a tough Italian New York kind of thing to do. <laughs> uh, Johnny played that night, I guess. And there was a whole bunch of people in the dressing room. And it's a very small dressing room uh, out by the ice machine cart. We were just outside the room in a little hallway. And Johnny got kind of pushy with me. And I was like, fuck, this is not good. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I just pushed him back, you know, and he was completely humiliated that this little kid just shoved him. So he shoved me and all all of a sudden we're just started fighting, like really fighting. And at one point I started winning and everyone just started screaming. And I was like in my head, God, I'm fighting with my idol. All these people are up up there in his dressing room screaming and they hate me. And this is the end of my whole life and my world and everything. But within 10 seconds, I realized they were cheering for me and it became really funny. And then Thunders really respected me for doing that because he had no choice. And he was like, yeah, you're OK, kid, because everyone was like, kill him, kill him, kill him. And then we became good friends, you know, then I, I mean, doesn't this, this reads like a movie, man, like his life, like like Howie Pyro's life was like a movie. It was like a punk rock Forrest Gump, dude, just like everywhere. Uh, hung out with everyone uh, then he said he continues on then I went to someone's house with Johnny and I guess they were planning that I was going to get high on heroin and it was like a big deal and I had never done it before I had been hanging out with high sticks before this and he was shooting me up with tulanols it was so disgusting 
So, wow, that's crazy. So he, so Johnny was planning on getting Howie high on heroin. So I had a little needle fixation already, but I had never done anything more than that. And I guess I, I was, and I guess it was going to be this big moment, you know, and you're going to be a man and that whole thing. And it was a real good fellas moment. So there were all these people there and they were all getting high. And then it was my turn. And I forget who it was, some girl. And she tied me off and they shot me up and I got really fucking high, but I didn't throw up and people started to cheer like, yeah, you know, I was really like a, like a man. And I was really a part of this. And I was really a part of the secret underground society, a whole magic vampire world beyond just going out to the clubs and stuff. That was a big part of my undoing, you know, but it was also a wonderful time period. Um. Here is Howie Pyro. Just just a quick note. I understand, as I said at the beginning when I started reading this, that Howie was was not stoked about this article when it came out and um, wanted uh, felt that things were taken out of context. I could see why. Like these are really just sort of like um, pastiches um, of, of various stories. OK, so this next one is so this is. Howie Pyro uh, and his interactions with Iggy Pop. Iggy never liked me, even though he doesn't know me, haha, or he thinks he doesn't know me, but he's always not liked me. I don't know. He was always a real dick to me for some reason. I didn't have many run ins with him. And after you print this, I probably won't either. You know, Iggy's got good friends with some of friends of mine, but he always had this weird attitude with me. I think he thinks I'm somebody else. I could never figure it out. So Iggy doesn't like me. He knows my face. He thinks I'm someone else. But we once got in a big fist fight in the VIP room at Danceteria. Iggy was just really obnoxious and drunk, and he was lying on this couch in the VIP thing. And he was yelling all this stuff, and we were yelling back at him. We were at that like point of punk where we were like, fuck you, you're old. I did this whole funny thing where I called him old and all hell broke loose. He just jumped on me and we were fighting, but he was so, so wasted and I was so out of it. Who knows if it was a joke, but Iggy's very perplexing to me. I don't know if he just turned into what he is one day after being a complete maniac freak for so long. Uh, or what seems like such a phony act, because when you meet him, he's like this normal guy. Weird, you know? I can't figure it out. I just can't figure it out. I want to interject here. I don't think it's fake. I think that there's just two personalities. There's Jim Osterberg and there's Iggy Pop. We've talked about this before. I talked about this with Pete uh, Marshall, Damien, who played uh, guitar and bass for Iggy. I mean, the idea is that Iggy Pop is, is, is an alter ego. When he gets on the stage, he gets possessed by Iggy Pop and he turns into this, 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 this truly wild child. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think maybe there's some element of that. Uh, Howie continues, Iggy doesn't remember the fight in the VIP room because I know people who've asked him. But all through the years, he just seems to hate me. Like I went backstage in, in Japan at one of his shows and he wouldn't even talk to me or even say hello to me. The only other good Iggy story is when we did that secret show at the Continental that was right on the corner of third Avenue, the Bowery and, and St. Mark's place. It's no longer there. It was right next to the McDonald's um, and it has been destroyed. It's gone. So he says the only other good story, Iggy story is when we did the secret show at the continental and we played with Iggy and just being alone with him in this small club. And the band was playing all these songs from the first two Stooges albums. And Iggy was standing next to me. Oh, you know what? I'm bet you, P, uh, Damien was in the band at that time. If it was, it was probably the nineties when DJN was there. Right. So he says, and Iggy was standing next to me. He came out in the crowd to hear what the bass sounded like during a sound check. And a million people were looking in the window and I'm just like standing next and just like the, sorry, a million people were looking in the window and I'm just me and standing next to me is Iggy singing down on the street, you know? And I'm just like, this is so weird. Wow. Cause those Stooges records were completely insane. Like in my mind, he was courageous for sure, but probably just crazy because he is crazy, but absolutely like, again, 
we were saying about the cramps. Iggy's instrumental in everything that came after him, probably more than anyone. I'm sure that you would agree that the whole time period in between the idiot and raw power, that if he had just gone away, I don't think the world would have been the same, honestly. I think the fact that Iggy was just around set up kind of a mark of musical insanity that people needed and that left people wanting to go out and meet that level. The Stooges were undeniably extraordinary. I mean, the fact that they existed in the 60s doing what they were doing is just so amazing. We have reveled about that many times on this show. We did it last night talking about the idea of how crazy it was that the Stooges were doing that. Like, well, in 19, the year 1970. <clears throat> um, the Blessed, this is, okay, so this is a story Howie Pyro tells about robbing Johnny Thunders. The Blessed got really popular within the first year of us hanging out. And me, I'm working at Manic Panic, but uh, as every store opened in St. Mark's Place, punk became a big deal. I worked at Trash and Vaudeville and Defiant Pose and this store and that store. And when whenever a punk store opened up, they hired me. I was Mr. Punk Store Guy. So in 1978, when they got into a big, you know, Nick Berlin, our guitar player, was this crazy kid, and we were all fighting a lot, and he quit. We didn't know what to do. We were actually really popular at the moment, and we were just like, fuck, we're actually making money. Actually, you know what it is? I think this is why. No, no, no. Maybe I'm wrong. I'll say that's why they didn't do those gigs with the damned, but this was 78. Um. He says, and things were happening and we didn't know what to do. And as a joke, because Walter Lure was always around and he was our friend, we asked Walter to be in the blessed. And he said, yes, which was like, what are you fucking kidding me? So suddenly everything really changed for us. We had the guy from the heartbreakers in our band and then Johnny thunders. He was always so jealous. So he'd have to come up and play with us. And then we became really, really popular after that when Johnny Thunders would play with us. In the 1980s, I was living in some place on 8th Street. Uh, I was with Eileen Kenley, different from the Ellen that... Wait, what? I Sorry. And I was with Ellen Kelly. Ken, uh, sorry, I like, can't read. I'm like really tired. In the 1980s, I was living with some people on 8th Street, and I was with Ellen Kenley, different from the Ellen that lived upstairs from Manic Panic. Uh, do you know who that is? Ellen Kenley was like an 80s supermodel or whatever. She's going to kill me for being so vague, but sorry. Anyway, we had no money. It was 1978 or 79, and Ellen had $5, and I had like nothing, and we walked to CBGB's. The same route we always walked, which was up Avenue A and across St. Mark's to First Avenue and then up Fifth Street where Kiev was and down the Kiev block that, uh, and then over to CB's. So we got to CB's and she's like, oh, my God, where's my money? I can't find my money, referring to her five dollars. And we're like, fuck, because they were pretty cheap about giving me drinks at CBGB's. So I only needed five dollars. And I was like, we have to retrace our steps and find the five dollars if you dropped it i figured it would be the within the first half block or something because she was fiddling with her stuff while we were walking we wound up really retracing our steps and we get to the church on fifth street between first and second avenue or second and third avenues kev is on the other corner and we're just walking and looking and all of a sudden i see paper and there's like the church and there's like a locked fence where the cars are parked behind it. And behind there, I just noticed out of the corner of my eye, a whole bunch of paper in the wind spinning around in a circle, like a little tornado of paper. I was like, what is that? And then I looked down and on the left side of the steps of the church, there was this pile of money, this giant pile of money and it's blowing into the parking lot and it's hundred dollar bills. And Ellen boosted me over the fence, which is like spiky and very high. What's that TV show where you put where they put you in the glass booth and you grab the money? It was like that. There's hundred dollar bills blowing around. and I'm grabbing them and shoving them down my pants and pulling them out of the air. And there's money everywhere. We still we start laughing and it was just completely insane. And we're just like, what the fuck is going on? So we took 
all of the money, stuffed it down my pants, and we went directly to CBGB's. We gave a few people a few hundred dollar bills, some of our friends who were just mystified by the whole thing. Then we went home, and at the end of the night, uh, quite profitable. So they made $12,000, an insane amount of money. We were totally flipping out. But the next day, everyone was talking about, oh, my God, did you see what happened? Did you see what happened? Did you see Johnny Thunders running down Fifth Street? Evidently, what had happened was Johnny Thunders and Miss Connie Ramone, the girlfriend of Arthur Killer Kane and later Dee Dee Ramone, were getting high. And Johnny knew about Connie's stash because she was a hooker and she had a lot of money and she stashed it in her apartment. She nodded out and he stole her life savings and she woke up and busted him, of course, because he's such a moron. And she flipped out and grabbed a giant butcher knife and was chasing him down the street. And all these people were in Kiev eating because that's where everybody ate since it was like a dollar to eat there. And everybody was like, oh, my God. The next day, everyone was talking about Connie chasing Johnny Thunders down the street with a butcher knife. And then me and Ellen are like, hmm, and we said nothing. Johnny must have ditched the money because Connie Connie had caught him stealing it. She was she was crazy. She was really, really crazy. And she almost cut off Arthur Killer Kane's thumb because he she thought he was cheating on her. Or maybe she was, maybe he was cheating on her. Um, and then yeah, eventually she ended up with Dee Dee Ramon for a while and even had the surname Connie Ramon, right? Um Johnny must have ditched the money because Connie caught him stealing it. And he must have ditched the money in the church and it just started blowing out. It's so stupid. And we bizarrely came across this money and we were looking for our $5. It doesn't make any sense. This whole thing is insane, but we never said anything. I wanted my whole life while Johnny was alive. I wanted to ask him about it, but what the fuck? I never did find out from either one of them. And then they both died. And this was when my heroin that, and this was when my heroin habit seriously went into complete overdrive, and I really had an endless supply of money for a really long time, and I kept most of the money. I guess Ellen took some. I counted it. Sorry, Ellen, but I kept most of it for months and months and months, maybe even a year. I mean, I don't know how long it lasted. Wow, that's insane, dude. What an insane story and there's nothing more dangerous than having a habit and having a lot of money um this is eldridge street so here is howie pyro talking about eldridge street let me readjust here um for some reason because of all the police sweeps when they raided all the dope houses eldridge street became the only street where you could buy dope And in every apartment, in every building on this one block on Eldridge Street was a dope dealer, like hundreds and hundreds of them. And everyone was just junkies. I mean, it didn't make any sense. You'd see Keith Richards pull up in a fucking limo. You'd see this crazy shit. I mean, like really, really crazy, desperate junkies. They knew where to go. And that's where they went. That's where they went. Everyone was there all the time, all day and all night. It was just a totally bizarre thing. We'd go there. We'd go into a storefront that was pitch black, and they'd shove as many people as they could fit at one time in the storefront, and then they'd chew everyone else away. It would suck if you weren't the first person that didn't get on the line. They'd be like, look down at the floor, and there'd be guys with baseball bats, and if you looked up, you'd get your head beat in because the guy was going to deliver the dope. They didn't want you to see him. And they didn't want you to rip them off. So it was intense. Yeah, the Lower East Side burnt out buildings that were dope houses. You had to be careful that you didn't fall through a hole in the burnt down building. You'd walk up half a flight of stairs till there were no more stairs. The whole building broke in half. And then someone would lower a bucket from two flights up and you'd put a $10 bill in the bucket and they'd reel it up and you just pray that they gave you something hard. Because they didn't have to if they didn't want to, you know. They did, usually. But if the cops came, you would jump into a pit of rats at the bottom of where the steps ended. And the building is broken in half. That, it sounds really dangerous. For a while, there were these two guys who were robbing everybody. These giant prison muscle dudes. A black guy and a white guy. And they dragged me into an abandoned building and almost cut my throat with a giant knife saying, where's the dope? Where's the dope? 
I pointed to my pocket and they took it. Thankfully, they did not kill me. You know what I mean? Really scary people. Uh, this is, okay, so this is Howie Pyro talking about going to cop dope with his dad. I was living with this girl, Marlene, who was a big junkie and a hooker, and she had all these scams that got her a lot of money, and she would buy us dope. We had a studio apartment on St. Mark's Place, like eight people lived in it, just hookers and junkies, you know, and we'd all run upstairs when someone was coming to fuck somebody, you know. Uh, then she had to do her thing. She was a hooker on third Ave and I was the lookout guy. Marlene would leave me these great love letters with dope taped on them. And I just found them all. And I saved all these things because they are really sick. It just got so crazy. And one day she just never came home. And I was so reliant on her for dope that I just waited, but Marlene never came back. I was so lame. I wound up and people saw this. I know people now that actually saw this. I crawled up St. Mark's place on my hands and knees after half a day of waiting for dope. I was so sick. You said about dope sick. I was so sick, so fucking sick and so desperate that I ran into the, the, that guy, the seven foot gray monster man. And I begged $10 off of him. And the guy took me to come cop somewhere and gave me some dope and told me that he'd see me later. And I crawled to Natasha's. Natasha's Natasha Adunzio, who had that store. Dave Street used to work at that store. I'll never forget this. I went into the bathroom at Natasha's and I put it in the cooker and he beat me. He took my dope and gave me like a beat bag. And I just sat there and cried and cried and cried. It was really horrible. And I went to Eileen Polk's house and she was so disgusted with me. She called my parents. Eileen didn't know what to do. And uh, I mean, after she copped dope from me, which sucked, she called my parents and she's just like, tell them. And it was just so horrible. One of the worst things that happened to them. And I remember that until the day I die, you know, wow, what a what a thing to say, Howie. He says, and I'll remember that until the day I die. You know, my dad just said, I'd have rather found out I had cancer. That's all he said. How that is really sad. Um, they came and got me and took me to my first detox, methadone detox. That was completely weird and didn't really work and really intense, you know. Like, the detox was closed. They weren't like now they're, bleh. They weren't like now. They were very few. It was Thanksgiving or some holiday. They were all closed, and my mom and dad were terrified to let me out of their sight. They came to Eileen Polk's house in the city, uh, not where they wanted to go. And they fucking sat down and I sat down and I had to tell them I'm a heroin addict. And it was terrible. You know, Eileen made me tell them. I told my dad that I had to get high. And until the rehab thing, I mean, there's nothing else I could do. So he gave me some money and he said, how much do you need? How much is enough? I went down. I went downtown and I copped 10 bags of dope. And of course, I did it in two days and my dad was angry. He's a tough guy from the Bronx and he already knew what was going on. And I was shooting up in the house and they knew I was shooting up in their house. It was unfathomable insanity. And I'm not saying that it wasn't, and I'm not here to judge, but uh, let me tell you something. It's like, it's scary. Cause like, you know, it, it could still lead to an overdose, but at the same time, it's like, when I read something like that, it makes me think like, yeah, your kid is killing themselves. Yeah. Like he's, he's doing a number on himself, but at least he's in your house and you know where he is. And you know, well, it's a little bit different today because if you get a bag that has fentanyl in it, you're, you, you will, you will die. You will just die. But I'm just saying there's something to the, the idea of, of having an open line of communication and knowing where your child is instead of, you know, just pushing them out on the street and, you know, where they could die in a gutter. So I don't know. It is, it is unfathomable insanity, but I don't think it's so insane to have your kid in your house, even if they're doing hard drugs, because at least you know where your kid is. At least you can be there uh, if they want help uh, to get better, you know? And then when I told them I had to go back, my dad was an inch away from having a stroke and a total freak out. 
And this time my uncle Chubby, wow, his dad's brother was uncle Chubby. Uncle Chubby, my dad's brother, was my favorite relative ever, 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 ever of all time. He passed away like 10 years ago. He was a jazz musician, and I always loved him, and he played with Benny Goodman and all these people. Uncle Chubby was like, I've had experiences, and I was like, bullshit, what do you know? He says, I know a lot about drugs. So me, my dad, and my uncle went to go cop dope. This is the most insane story. This should be in a movie. Yes, it should be. Howie, and it's a shame you didn't write the book that could be turned into the screenplay, you know? Um, he said, so this should be in a movie, and this is so crazy. We went to Cop Dope on a day when someone was having an election, and they were like, there were these giant dope sweeps and dope busts everywhere. Everyone in the entire city was like zombies because no one knew where the dope was, and everyone was sick, and everyone was going crazy. And it was like Night of the Living Dead everywhere downtown, which is actually kind of like what supposedly what Night of the Living Dead is about. The Glenn, the, the dancing song for the misfits, uh, just about but the, the zombies or bums on the street. You know, this ain't no feeling in my arm. Um, we drive around and we stopped and we pick we, and we were picking up junkies just driving around with these sick people. Then I'd see that guy, Mike the giant six foot five guy who beat me for dope the week before. And he looked like Frankenstein. This guy was so scary looking. He got in the car with me, my dad, my uncle, this giant freaking guy with gray skin. And we're all driving around. I mean, I had to get dope. I have hurt my parents so much. You know, I've broken their hearts. And this time my dad wouldn't give me the dope. And whenever I started to get really sick, my mother would dole me out one bag, which is so heartbreaking for them that they have to touch it. You know what I mean? And me scurrying to the bathroom with a syringe. I mean, it was just really awful. Um, But I think it's good that Howie, like, later in life became aware of that. Some people don't. Some people, like, are oblivious and don't care and don't care that they're hurting their loved ones. Um. But that doesn't seem, I mean, how he seems very self-aware of that at this point in his time when he's telling these stories. So we drive to Brooklyn and Mike, this really scary motherfucker, pointed at me and my dad and says, is this going on? So finally, we all get dope in some burnt out building in Brooklyn and people are coming up to my dad's car, fucked up, crazy people. Um, but to say how much they love me, you know what I mean? When <laughs> that's crazy, when I made it to the detoxed and I detoxed and stayed clean for about two months. And then one day, a lot of time had passed. I got a call six or seven months later and it was Marlene, you know, my junkie girlfriend. She had fallen asleep. She lived in Larchmont with her parents. Larchmont is right over there. That's so funny. Who had money. So Marlene fell asleep at the wheel of her car driving to Larchmont and was in a massive car wreck and broke every bone in her face you know she would like what went to the hospital and was like in the hospital for almost a year so she called me and she just and just hearing her voice it made me sick marlene was like i just have to get out of the hospital and she told me the whole thing at the time i was still living with my parents i was still trying to get my shit together i had gotten a job but went out and had gotten high so i started using again wow there he is with alice cooper um, so this is Cleveland. I think this is the final story and we're going to, we're going to cap it here, guys, because it's late. It's 1230 going for almost two and a half hours. Um, this is Howie Pyro telling a story about Cleveland. Marlene's the one who brought me to Cleveland. She got a job in Cleveland as a DJ at this big rock station. I don't know how she pulled this thing off. She was sending me money and I just buy all this dope and take a train and go to Cleveland, skimming all the bags all the way. It was so, this is in quotes, so retarded. Uh, that's what Howie says. I'm just reading it. Um, the pejorative word. I would be like running drugs to Cleveland. I would come and buy all these drugs and then on the way there, they'd be half done, you know? So I'd stay with Marlene for a while in Cleveland, and then the dead boys would come into town, and I was just there. We were hanging out, and no one knew who I was. I had never been there before, hanging out or anything. 
I knew a few people, but usually there was nothing happening. I mean, I just hang out at the whole t hotel swingo and do drugs. I didn't pretend to be Johnny Thunders in Cleveland, those fucking assholes, the dead boys. So what happened? I was wearing a... Uh, bleh, let's take that line again. I didn't pretend to be Johnny Thunders in Cleveland, those fucking assholes, the dead boys. So what happened? I was wearing the red jacket, the red jacket that he's wearing on the back of the first Dolls album cover in front of the gem spot. That's what I'm thinking of. At the end, uh, uh, Second Avenue and St. Mark's Place, you have gem Spa, and that's where the New York Dolls took that, that very iconic uh, picture for their album cover. Um, Walter Lure gave him the red jacket on the back of the first Dolls album. Walter Lure gave him that jacket for his 18th birthday, how his 18th birthday, how he says that was a good birthday. So I had just gotten it and looked and it, I looked exactly like Johnny Thunders. And I went to see the dead boys play at some massive show. I was wearing that famous red jacket and the dead boys come out for an encore and we're like, oh, everybody, there's a special guest in the audience. And we're all looking around like, cool. And Stiv is snickering away. And he's like, Johnny Thunders? And he's like, Johnny Thunders. Everyone was like, what? And I'm like, wow, where? Uh, Stiv makes a face and points at me. And I'm like, fuck you, man. Fuck you, fuck you. And these girls were like, totally like, oh, my God, you're Johnny Thunders. I, I had nothing to do with the whole thing. And it's a loud big show, and everybody thinks I'm Johnny Thunders being modest, you know. Stiv, gra uh, Stiv grabs my arm and pulls me on stage and goes, don't plug in, just pretend to play. So we, play, so we played a couple of Dolls and Heartbreaker songs, and after the show, these girls had an ounce of Coke, and they're like, give it to us, and everything was amazing. And I was like, fuck it, I'm going to go with it. We were scamming a lot of coke in the whole week. I realized no, sorry, we were scamming a lot of coke and that whole week. I was really getting into shooting coke, which is one of the most horrible, insane things you could ever do. There's never enough coke when you're shooting coke. I could understand that. So we're at this girl's house and she's about to hand over this huge amount of coke and we're just out of our minds, all of us. And then the phone rings. It's Chrissy Hind. Uh, from the pretenders calling from New York and they're all excited. They're like, oh yeah, we're with Johnny Thunders. He's been here all week. And Chrissy Hine goes, I was just with Johnny just like an hour ago in New York. And all of a sudden the room turns dead and I'm in big, big trouble, real big trouble. You know what I mean? I mean, we've been talking a lot. We've been taking a lot of stuff from a lot of people and it fucked up our whole reality. It got real ugly, real fast. And I was literally running out of the town. Ha ha. It was so bad. It was bad. So we ran away. Legs note. Eventually, Howie got clean from drugs and alcohol in the early 90s. I did not know that Howie Pyro was sober. That's awesome. Something that we both have in common. And that's the end of this part one. If Legs ever drops the part two, we'll definitely read it. But I'm going to conclude um, I'm going to conclude my show there. I, like I said, I did interview. I did get to interview Howie and he was super sweet with his time. Such a sweetheart. I'm glad that I got to meet this guy. I really am. And like I said, I wish that he had written a book, but he lives on his essence lives on in all of the people that knew him, right? Like leaving all these wonderful tributes. He's truly a loved and missed dude already and you know just passed away and whatnot um and yeah i mean i don't know what else to say except that what an amazing guy who lived truly a remarkable life um and just yeah that's it that's all i got no um sponsored ads or anything tonight because this is uh um uh, like uh the show is about the celebrating someone's life i just don't want to like i don't mind like ads playing on the video but i don't want to like sell you guys on anything uh while talking about his life having him just pass away it's just not appropriate so there'll be no ads on this show oh, no, sorry no um uh no sponsors no sponsored stuff or or promotion promotion of any kind apart from that pizza punk show at the beginning that's it 
Um, I can't talk anymore and I'm exhausted. So um, rest in pizza, Howie Pyro, shine on. You are not forgotten, obviously. Um, may your memory always be a blessing. Peace and hair grease.